Hey folks, Randy Newberg here from beautiful, wonderful southern Arizona where the temperatures when we've been hunting this week are about in the mid-60s, almost 70. And I am doing a podcast tonight with two prior guests who, now I got them both together, they are cooking uh, experts. They are everything I'm not. And uh, when we get them on the podcast, we're going to have a ton of fun. But before we do that, uh, I want to talk about the companies that make this possible. Uh, we call it Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio for a reason, because the great folks at Leupold always support anything and everything we do. Go to Leupold.com. I left SHOT Show last week, and they said, Randy, you get an advanced copy of this. And it's the new BX5 10 by 42 binos. Ooh, I like them. I really, really like them. And when you're coos deer hunting like we are, uh, and tomorrow we're going to have a guest. He's going to remind us that it's really called cow's deer after Elliot Cows. But if you use that term in southern Arizona, there's a good chance you're going to get beat up and thrown in the ditch. So I call it coos deer, just like the locals want it called. So anyhow, 15 by 56 binos on a tripod. That is what you want to have when you're hunting coos deer in southern Arizona. And then we got the great folks at Orion Coolers. Uh, a week before I came down here, Marcus, our, one of our production guys who you've seen uh, on some hunts and stuff, he and his wife Kara were down here archery javelina hunting in Arizona. And they shot two javelina that have been sitting in an Orion cooler for a week. Yeah. And today, our guest, guests, cooked that javelina, and we just ate it. And the next person who says that javelina cannot be made to be palatable probably is going to get kicked in the knee because Hank Shaw proved that javelina can be excellent. But we'll get into that later. OrionCoolers.com. Use promo code RANDY, and you're going to get a really cool tumbler from Orion Coolers when you buy the best cooler that I've ever used. <clears throat> Man, if I sound like I got the crud, it's called the Shot Show. Sh uh, we can't say the last four letters. Uh, anyone who goes to Shot Show knows you end up with some sort of hoo-boo, itch, pox, and canker when you go there. And you end up doing this all day. So I'm sorry, folks. You're going to hear a lot of sniffling on this podcast. But when I was at Shot Show, uh, met up with the great folks at go hunt uh you wonder well, a lot of you ask how do you draw so many tags randy well we've been doing a series of videos with the go hunt guys and it talks about state by state every state how we do it how we get tags how we use their drawing odds the best drawing odds out there how we use their filtering 2.0 and if you use promo code randy r-a-n-d-y they're going to give you 50 dollars of store credit at their gear shop when you sign up for that insider service. So the strategy articles they have, the application strategy articles are worth the, the price of admission. When you sign up, you get so many things besides that. Plus using our promo code for our listeners, they're going to give you a $50 free credit in that gift shop, gear shop. Maybe it could be a gift shop if you want it to be, but if I was buying that kind of gear, it wouldn't be for a gift. It'd be for myself. So, GoHunt.com, click on Insider, use promo code Randy. Onyx Maps, we're down here in southern Arizona. All of us have our Onyx Maps uh, hunt app on our uh, smartphones, and we're driving around doing everything. We know exactly where we want to be. The water holes are there, the roads, the trails, the land ownership, everything. And we've saved the map in Topo, Satellite, or Aerial, whatever you want to call it, and Hybrid. We can toggle between the three map types. Onyx maps. They are, they're the game changer. So use, when you go there, we're making this easy for everybody. Use promo code Randy, and they're going to give you 20% off any app products that you buy at onyxmaps.com. You guys have seen us use them. It is the best product out there. So with that out of the way, when I click the switch here, I have got... The man himself, the myth, the legend, Mr. Hank Shaw, has come all the way from his... Uh, I, I got to admit, 
When I called Hank and said, you got to be here with us because we're going to shoot all kinds of stuff in Arizona and we need you to cook it. He said, Randy, do you know what weekend that is? That is the final weekend of waterfowl hunting in California. And it could cause me to have to sleep out in the street. I'm like, oh, Hank, we don't want that. He said, but if you could convince Holly that she could come down with me and we could shoot ducks, that might suffice for her having to pass on a, the final weekend. So we have Hank Shaw and along with us is his, they always call it the better half and Hank will admit the better half is here, Holly Heiser. But she's not on the podcast. She picked up some sort of crud at a trade show. So she said she's, she doesn't want to be here sniffling and coughing on the podcast. So our other guest has been on this podcast twice before, Jonathan O'Dell, who is everything small game in Arizona. He's the resident historian for Arizona Game and Fish. He is, he is all kinds of things. Every time we have him on, people are like, man, I didn't know that. So I'm going to click the switch here. And uh, as quick as I do that, Hank and Jonathan are going to be on the line with us. Stay tuned, folks. All right, I like, folks. I like the two-fisted. I, I, I told, uh, yeah, <laughs> Hank already noted that Jonathan is here two-fisted. What do you got there, Jonathan? You got a Mountain Dew and a what else? Dos Equis. A Dos Equis. And Hank, he hides his in, uh, Hank hides his in this, uh, uh, what do they call these, a cooler? Koozie. Koozie. If lead ain't flying, then you ain't trying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I just spilled his, is it a Dos Equis? No, it's an it's a Arizona IPA. Arizona IPA. There you go. So this, this podcast will be, I guess, enriched by the beverage. The, I told these guys, come and be relaxed. Bring whatever drink you want, but bring your stories and bring your recipes. So... I'm not sure who wants to start or where we're going to go with this, but Jonathan, did I introduce you correctly when I said you are all things small game at Arizona Game and Fish? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, uh, I'm known for that. Uh -huh. um, primarily, a lot of my focus has been in the migratory stuff lately while Wade's been doing the Upland. Okay. Uh, I was in the Upland and now we switched over and... But so I still help him out quite and a bit. And you're the two-time defending World Dove Cook-Off champion that is from correct. Yuma, at the Yuma, Arizona Cook-Off. That's right. right. That, that must be a big trophy. I mean, that, that's like, do you get up on the stand like at the Super Bowl and... Yeah, you kiss it like the Stanley Cup and, yeah. you know, take a yeah. couple laps around the, the, the kitchen. Okay. So. And Hank, I, I, I introduced you as like the, the, the man, the myth, the legend. I mean, author of many things, former political investigative reporter, journalist, writer. It's been a fair bit of mileage. Mostly, though... <laughs> The like the guy who just made a javelina into something I'm now craving. <laughs> I am pissed that we only had one javelina to eat while we're well. We really have part of other one, but Marcus said he's taking the rest. Well, of Well, I think I've just proven that Marcus is not going to share the second javelina. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you would have done a crappy job, Marcus would have said, "Ah, you can, you know, I don't need to, the hassle of hauling this other one that back to Montana." Been funny, and then like, the second one is just brilliant. You know? It's like, yeah. What? Uh, you know? You ever play pool? You never yeah. play pool against me, did you? <laughs> oh well. Last time you were on the podcast, Hank was at Backcountry Hunters, mm -hmm. uh, and at that time, which book was it? At that time, was it Buck Buck Moose or Duck Duck Goose? That I we were. think it was. I think the venison book had was just coming out at that okay. point. Okay. So, uh, those of you who follow Hank's website, Hunt Gather Cook, I got that right. dot mm -hmm. com and the Facebook page, Hunt Gather Cook. Yep. Uh, you, at one time, you sent me a message and said, I'm thinking of shutting down this Facebook page. Yeah. Um, and you got them back in line? You straightened them no, out? No, I changed things. <clears throat> um, I, uh, I run the, a Facebook forum called Hunt, Gather, Cook. Uh -huh. And it's, so I changed it to a closed forum. So uh -huh. it keeps out, uh, like, you know, Riff -raff. spammers and, and, like, Indonesian, you know, whatever, whatever. And what's more is we get to ask a few questions about whoever who shows up. And like, you have to be interested in foraging or fishing or, or hunting when it comes to the food aspect of it. And yeah. if you're not, if you're just there to show off your antlers, well, this probably isn't your, 
I mean, do that. You can do that somewhere else, yeah. and and so it's helped a lot. I mean, uh, that, and we have a couple of moderators, uh, and the three of us kind of rule with an iron fist, in the sense that you just got to be cool, you know, yeah. man. I mean, there's there are hippie Earth children, you know, vegans on that forum, and there are dually driving, you know, <laughs> people somewhere to the right of Attila the Hunt, and what they, where they all get in common is that we're all there to get smarter about wild food, no matter what the wild food is. Yeah. So I mean, we've had like, you know, I mean, it's one of the weird little things. We all have lines, right? We all yeah. lines that we draw. And I don't eat dogs. I don't eat cats. I'm not uh-huh. going to eat a coyote. I'm not going to eat a wolf. I'm not going to eat a bobcat or a lynx yeah. or whatever. I'm just not. It's just not me. Yeah. And and but other people on this forum do. Yeah. And so just because I don't think it's something that I want to do doesn't mean that I'm going to shut that conversation down as long as it's civil and it's and it's about like, hey man, I shot this lynx and I want to eat it. Um, and then you'll get some dude from Canada well, like, well, yeah, well, I eat five links a year and this is what I do. And it's, it's, it's just a, it's an amazing forum um, that makes us all very f- much smarter than we were before we look at it. No, I, I agree. Why you let me in there, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, 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 I have never posted anything other than like a thumbs up or something because I, I'm like, man, I am such a rookie here. Growing up in northern Minnesota where, you, you know, it's like, 12 ways to make a tuna noodle hot dish is kind of like the you know, epitome the, of... The, that dish, the tuna noodle hot dish you posted <laughs> with the beaver meat in it, that was pretty good. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see it. <laughs> it must have been one of your minions who posted it. It was under your name. Oh, man. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> Dang. <clears throat> I better go and check that again. Hmm. Well... Well, we'll work on that then, because I'm about ready to go into some sever- serious beaver trapping. I know. March. Said, March is kind of a good month for that, Mar- isn't it? March is really good yeah. beaver trapping. So if you need some, some beaver for recipes, you, you let me know. I'll have no shortage. Okay. Yeah, I'll see you Musk on March 2nd. So. Whatever. Yeah, you'll be in Bozeman March yeah, 2nd. Yeah, exactly. Right? Selling books, right? Oh, my God. I can, I can actually take a, a vacuum-sealed beaver carcass in carry-on on the plane home. How cool would that, that be, huh? Oh, my. I can't. I'm, we need to videotape <laughs> <laughs> the reaction of TSA. Like, What's you, that? Why it's a beaver, man? Do, do you do you want the head and the tail removed, or you want like the whole thing? Yeah, I would I would think it pre dead and ready to cook. Okay. Well, you tell me how to get it, and right. I'll have it for you. That'd be perfect. Yeah, we're doing you and I and Hank Patterson and someone else. I'm trying to remember who the fourth person is. Yeah, we're doing a storytelling thing. I, I you, you will excel. There's no doubt. I, you know, I, I got a couple stories. Yeah, a few. <laughs> huh. Well, we're, we're, you guys uh, went duck hunting this morning. We're here in southern Arizona, and I know people are thinking duck hunting in southern Arizona. And today you shot your first Mexican duck, right? I did. I was very, very psyched about that, actually. Yeah. And on a prior podcast, Jonathan went into the great detail of Arizona's uh, unique standing uh, among the Mexican duck residency and how so many other places they call them hybrids or they call them this or they call them that. Yeah, there, there's so there's five states that have um, Mexican duck listed in the regulations. So in the Pacific Flyway, it's no more than uh, two hen mallards or Mexican-like ducks. That's generally what it says. Mexican hyphen like duck. Yeah. And so uh, um, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Texas. Uh, the, the west, far west Texas with the Rio Grande and all that stuff. Um, huh. uh, just really, really interesting. And, and so the, uh, uh, the American Ornithologist Union doesn't recognize it um, as its own separate species. Uh, and thus, because the American Ornithologist Union doesn't ex- you know, accept it as a, as a separate species, neither does Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, it's kind of this, this big, long tradition um, at least within the, the Pacific Flyway, and particularly Arizona, because we just have a, an abundance of, of Mexican ducks that breed here. Um, huh. And this year, the hatch was phenomenal. So they breed here, they stay here, they're like a year-round resident? Yeah, very similar to wood ducks. Um, you know, they, they'll move off into other ponds, different areas, things like that. But it's, it's really a, a fascinating bird, because you get them on the Rio Grande in, in New Mexico and things like that. But So we'll find... Um, you know, a, a stock tank, like out here, you know, you've been seeing with all the coos deer and all that. Um, we'll find a stock tank like that, and there will be a pair that breed there, and she'll lay the nest somewhere away from the stock tank until it hatches and bring the young ones into it. And it's this kind of real ecology neat thing that these stock tanks are what, you know, 
um, they're using. Man-made. Um, like, right, yeah. So if, if you don't live in the West, when people say a tank, if you, yeah. if you came from where I did in northern Minnesota when I first went to college here in Arizona, and they'd say, oh, walk up to that tank. I'm out there looking for like a, a bathtub type water <laughs> catchment. What you're talking about, Jonathan, is there's a, an arroyo or something, and they put a big berm in there, and it catches the water. Yeah, a lot way. of times we'll refer to them as dirt tanks. Right. And um, we, we call them just cattle ponds. Yeah. Yeah, just, and there's varying sizes all across the, the desert because, of course, we've had a lot of cattle ranching uh, yeah. throughout the history and stuff. And uh, the Arizona Game and Fish Department actually even installs some of these tanks um, and even more sophisticated ones that have water collecting systems and, and all mm -hmm. that where they're not in a wash or an arroyo to naturally collect water yeah. um, uh, and be able to, to, you know, put water out for wildlife as well as cattle. And sometimes we exclude the cattle from it so that the wildlife has access only and um, but there, there's just a, a fascinating thing that these ducks, you know, uh, they'll use some bigger areas of water and things too, but it's, it's neat to find this little nest of blue eggs, um, in the middle of the desert with, you know, a stock tank somewhere, you know, probably within a hundred yards or so. Yeah. Uh, so it's a true desert so. duck. Yeah, kind of. That's kind of cool. Yeah. That's an adaptation that you, I guess is not expected when you think of the normal migratory ducks going right all the way north and coming south. So what else did you guys shoot today, Hank? You shot? Uh, we got, well, it was kind of mayhem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, everybody listening to this, like if you've ever jumped tanks or jumped cattle ponds or yeah. just jump shot to begin with, you kind of never know what's on the other side of the berm. Kind of like the Cracker Jack box, right? You never know what prize is in the bottom. It's exactly right. So we did, I think, eight tanks today uh -huh. and we, nothing. Nothing, nothing. Dead skunk in one of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, there, like one, uh, Holly jumped on her side. There was a snipe of all things. And so we were just flabbergasted. So she never had a time to get the gun up. And yeah. like a snipe in the middle of the desert, what? Yeah. You know, I mean, we're big snipe hunters in, in Northern California. And like, it's all boggy, grassy, greeny stuff. And like, this is just, this is a stock tank in the middle of, <laughs> like, I mean, we're like 10 miles from the Mexican border. And it's like, okay. Um, so we missed that one. So it's just nothing, nothing, nothing. And then finally, it's, it's the last tank. Yeah. So Wade is driving as fast as we can to get to this tank before sundown. Because guess what? Sundown is the end of the season. So oh, if we yeah. didn't make it by sundown, that was it. And, you know, and, and we would not have any ducks on So our today was senior. the last day of season. The last day. Oh. So we get to this tank, and Holly and I are kind of creeping up on either side of it. And she spots a duck first. And she's like, there's one right there. And I'm like, okay. And <laughs> so I kind of move a little bit to the left, and she's a little bit to the right. And you kind of creep up, and it's like, surprise! And so... She brings her gun up on a on a bird to the right. It's a dark bird. I don't know what it is. And then there's another bird like right in front of me. Okay, there's another one. Boom! I shoot this bird. And then oh my god, there's some more birds in front of us. There's birds flying everywhere. I gotta shoot. Oh, that looks like a Mexican melon. I gotta kill that Mexican melon. It is dead. Oh yes, but it's running. Uh, stop running. Good. All right. There's another bird flying over the head. Oh yes, it's an open field tackle. That one's hitting the ground. And then <laughs> <laughs> and so this goes on. And and and, and Wade's dog Shiloh is running around trying to catch the birds that are like because we clipped one and it's. To, like it's diving in the tank and like it's only a tank right so it's yeah. like you know you can we, we could probably like saying the thing to get the bird if it was on the water <laughs> <laughs> but but we but the dog got it and so like oh it was all said and done after like i don't know 90 seconds yeah. we had five ducks wow and uh and I, I reloaded my over and under six times no way yep but oh just finishing one off or well, I've shot I've shot that same gun for se seventeen years, so I can cycle shells through it pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> People think you're shooting a semi. Yeah. <laughs> huh. So I've never seen a Mexican duck until you guys brought that one in. I've evening. never seen one in hand. Uh, I saw one on somebody else's strap, and he wouldn't let me touch it. <laughs> <laughs> they coveted his Mexican dollar. I, I did. Mallard. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and the beauty of it is, see, that's what you're going to tell them, you know. I mean, we, we ended, up, you ended up with a Mexican duck, uh, and he was a mallard uh, hybrid. He had a little bit of the, the introgression, 
look like a, a little F1 generation. So, you know, first out of the shoot, but, um, and then you got a ring neck, beautiful gold Gorgeous ring neck. Jack. Oh, he's spectacular. A blackjack? Mm -hmm. And that's a nickname for a ring neck? Ring ring neck yeah, we call them yeah. blackjacks. And then you had three buffalo heads. Mm -hmm. And so this is the beauty of Arizona that I was telling you about. Yeah. You never know what's coming next. Yeah. Last year, I shot a widgeon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Random. Um, and <laughs> what, that guy was lost, man. I mean, like, what's he doing? Here? Well, and so before Hank and them came down, I, I went down. I was scouting for, for this, you know, this last day of the duck season to see what was out there. And I ended up taking a, a cinnamon teal. And so, you know, it's, it's just this really bizarre thing. You just, in Arizona, it's, it's pretty hard to get seven of the same ducks. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, and not to mention, I mean, we went down to, to the lake mm -hmm. and, we saw and set decoys this morning. Um, and we just were set up on the wrong side. They were going to the other side of the inlet we were on. But a lot of mallards we saw, cinnamon teal. Uh, and then, yeah, the gadwalls yep. was rolling around. So it's, you just never know, um, you know, what will show up next. So, well, that, the, your, your kind of potpourri of ducks <laughs> is kind of, you could express that across the entire hunting opportunity here yeah. in, oh, yeah. in Arizona. So today I was chasing coos deer got within 40 yards that's a story for another day you guys were hunting ducks wade was hunting quail yep brian and sam went out hunting rabbits what am i missing <laughs> we didn't have an elk tag i guess yeah now, uh are squirrels still open uh main season's open uh, or no it's the main season's closed we have a, a little management season but that's about it a management season on squirrels. It's kind of hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you drive up and say, oh, that one's a cold squirrel. Exactly. Yeah, we can sure. get rid of that was one. Thinking, right, it was cool. 30 inches across. Yeah, it, yeah. It, He's got some bad color in his ears. He. <laughs> no, actually, the, there was a couple of places we put Aberts where they compete um, with the native squirrels in, in the range. And this one just happens to be our, an Arizona gray squirrel territory that we put Aberts on top of. and. And so, are those the ones with the really pretty white ears? The, and the the, great, yeah, the real tall tufts. So when I squirrels. was up in uh, northern Arizona this year, I was up on the kaibab deer hunting. Oh, yeah. Saw some humongous Wait, squirrels there. you got a kaibab there. deer tag? <laughs> yeah, I could have just as well drawn a phoenix deer tag. Yeah. Yeah, it's <sighs> another story for yeah. another day. <laughs> kind of an awe. <laughs> yeah. And then on the south rim, we saw some other kind of squirrels. So what? you guys got more squirrels here. Yeah, different, but they're all big. Mm -hmm. You don't oh, yeah. have little squirrels in Arizona. Well, the red squirrels are, are the smallest of them. Oh, all, I but didn't see any red squirrels. That's pretty here. common. That's a that's probably the widest distribution of squirrels I think na natively across the country. But um, so yeah, the red squirrels, which are very common in most other areas, um, we have the Abert squirrels, which is only in the four corner states. Right. Um, and then uh, Arizona right. grays, which are only pretty much mostly in Arizona and a little bit in New Mexico. Uh, and then we have uh, the Mexican fox squirrel, the Chiricahua fox squirrel, that only occurs in one mountain range in Arizona, uh, oh. and then spreads further south into Mexico, but they're totally cut off from the rest of the population in the Sierra Madres. Um, and then there's subspecies, which you saw. Um, there's the standard Aberts, which has the white belly, yeah. uh, big ears and all that stuff. And then you go to the north rim of the Kaibab, and we have the Kaibab squirrel, which has this, it's a melanistic, um, darker belly. It's okay. like that Algonquin black that you get in uh, eastern gray squirrels. Never seen one. So, like, uh, in the east, there's, you know, your regular gray squirrel, and then sometimes it'll be a black squirrel. Yeah. And the nickname for that is an Algonquin black, and it's it's just a gray squirrel, but it's just darker. And you'll see them, weirdly, I think they're really like D.C. sometimes, but we, we hunt them in Ohio. Like, in Ohio, you can get the trifecta. You can get a regular gray, a black, and then a fox squirrel all in the same morning. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. I'm not a squirrel guy, but when I saw those ones up on the Kaibab Plateau, as good as the squirrel hunting looked compared to how tough the deer hunting was, oh, no. I was thinking of switching over to squirrel hunting. Well, and that's the beauty. Uh, uh, you know, the Kaibab um, is one of the areas that gets the most snow yeah. um, every single year in Arizona. I mean, sometimes on those points that overlook the Grand Canyon, there's 30 feet of snow. I mean, there's no way you're getting out there. And, and yeah. snow is the real limiting factor to the, the Abert species. Huh. Um, how much there is and how long it stays. Um, these, you know, these these squirrels are are companions with the ponderosa pine, but at some point, you know, they're they're switched to 
you know, the winter is really tough and they have to switch them to poor quality food and they're just hoping for a thaw to be able to get some stuff on the ground because huh. they'll eat a, some mushrooms and stuff when they come in and, and all that. But um, so it's been so warm here. I keep thinking, you know, the, the Kaibab squirrel, it's been, it's been great to watch this rebound. And I had a, I had a great season hunting Kaibab squirrels probably, it was about five years ago. And I thought, man, this was going to be the last best year, you know, because yeah. they're, they're going to get hammered with snow and kind of push that population back. And I've been saying that every year for like six, five, six years now of just, man, this will be the last best year. Oh, the last best, because they're just doing phenomenally well. They've just, it's been so mild. Yeah. Um, they haven't had deep snows to, to kind of take the population down a little bit. And so, yeah, I mean, you got to see the effects of it. It's just squirrels running everywhere. Yeah. Uh, I, it was crazy. I, and they're squirrels big too. gone wild. <laughs> yeah. Your new book there. I, you were showing it to I me. I have a whole chapter on squirrels. Squirrels. See, I've never been a squirrel hunter because I grew up where there were red squirrels. And I, my grandma made me eat the first one that I shot with my BB gun. And that's the last one I've that's ever That's right, because you're from way up north in Minnesota. Yeah, way up there. <laughs> up there in the trees, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Hank has the best Minnesota, uh, I, I guess, uh, dialect when he puts it on. <laughs> Yeah, I, he has me rolling in the dirt because it's it's like at the coffee shop at my mom's old little diner. It's, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's not go there. <laughs> uh, but so we're we're talking about all the opportunity we are enjoying this week. So down here this week with us is Hank and Jonathan. Wade Zarlingo, who some of you have, Wade was on a podcast last year on about quail hunting. Remember, we did mm -hmm. the quail hunt. He's been on the, uh, you've then he's shown him in the TV show every once in a right, while. He gets on the TV show every once in a while. Uh, and then Marcus, camera guy, and his wife, Kara, were down here early, Havelina hunting. And so far, they're, they've had greater success than everybody else. And then we have David Brinker from Sitka Gear, who's, determined that in spite of having one of the worst flu bugs, he's going to somehow kill a coos deer with his bow, and I hope he does. And Brian Call from the Gritty Bowman, and he was, <laughs> Brian was really gritty today when we pulled up there. He, he looked like he's, he had all the grit he wanted when we pulled up there today. The deer had outsmarted him. Uh, and then Sam Soholt, uh, who has the public land school bus. Sam's been on our podcast before. And Sam so far has drawn the most blood with the bow. He shot a cottontail yesterday. <laughs> yeah. It cost him $65 of arrows and broadheads. Wow, for I just can't believe that. It's just so sad. But the guy, I mean, the guy wanted that rabbit. Man. Yeah. Is. So th those are all the people with us. I think... Some of them, it's their first trip to Arizona. Hank, you could just as well take up residency here for yeah, all may, the hunting you've done here in the last 12 months. Well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you were down here Mern's hunting, and then you, the you, you cheated. You came after deer with a rifle. What do you mean, cheat? Well, compared to what we're trying to do with oh, a sharp play stick like the, and a like string. The, this, the crazy music, like, oh, <laughs> and Randy rocked across the mountain <laughs> and didn't get close enough to a deer. And then I just, like, blasted one and it's, you know. But I'm eating coos deer. I know. I you're, hope you you're, do, too. You're the one laughing every day when you lift the coos deer, right? <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I have super respect for anybody who can shoot one of these things with a bow. Um, well, I, I, I had enough hard, enough time, hard enough time shooting one of the rifle this year. Yeah. You were here in December. Yeah. In December. And then you were down here Mern's quail hunting. Yep. So in I was, last February. Last February was Mern's. And then, uh, Labor Day, we we're, I was down in Yuma quail hunting. Oh, you did the Yuma we quail hunt? Hunting. Huh? Yep. Dove hunting. Yep. Dove hunting. Dove hunting. Yeah. There are dove and, isn't uh, that fun? Oh, it's a blast. Yeah. This is the second time I've done it. Really? Yeah. I did it la the year before last. I If I don't have some sort of conflict, got to go and do it. Jonathan really, yeah, it was almost, did he set you up as well as he set me up? <laughs> he had decoys out there. Oh, yeah. Took me to the field w with white wings. I mean, white wings are a hell of a lot easier to knock down than a morning dove. Because oh. they fly in just like this straight line. It's like. Shooting some sort of skeet or something. I mean, well, it's like but a, pole, big, a big white wing takes a lot of punishment. 
Well, yeah. But a lot of times in, in uh, on the on the opener, you're shooting like the, the young of the year. Well, not even like young, <laughs> young, young of the month. month. <laughs> 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 did That's you did you hit the firing line? What the firing line? Is that what we were at? There were pellets whizzing around, but well, that was the the the, uh, the second day. The first day we hit the white wing field, and it was kind of we didn't have a whole ton of people. But right. Hank's talking about up by uh, Fortuna Wash, where it's just oh. it's you know it's not necessarily shoulder to shoulder, but man, there's a lot of folks sitting there. And, yeah. and it's for like two miles. There's a party against each other within reason. So it's like, yeah, it's not shoulder to shoulder. So there's no one's being jerks or anything. Right. But it's like, okay, we've got our little spot. And then 20 yards to the right of where we end, somebody else begins yeah. for three miles. Yeah. And so it sounds like, I'm not sure. What does it sound like? It's the sound of conservation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's all a, the shooting. It's the sound of it's conservation. It's such a yeah. great line. It, it, it's fun, though. <laughs> we actually had our favorite hunt because we had a three days. And so the first day we did the firing line, which was fun, but I have a hard time with that because it's yeah. just a lot of times the bird I was tracking got shot out from under me, um, <laughs> like all morning long. It was really frustrating. And so the second day, uh, there wasn't very many doves, so it wasn't that great. Um, and although I did make a pretty epic open field tackle on a pigeon at like 70 yards. So that was, You got a pigeon? Yeah, like it went dead overhead at like 70 yards and I just... I. It was perfect. It looked oh, like smog man. falling on Lake Town. It was just awesome. Really? <laughs> <laughs> cool. And then the last day, we went back to the firing line, but there had been like a this pulse of like a tropical storm that had come through the previous afternoon, and it, and it blew out all the hunters as well. Huh. So we went to this place where there was, you know, like I just said, it was just shoulder to shoulder for three miles, and there was three other parties in the whole place. That's it? Yeah. So, but oh, the man. doves have kind of shifted too. So the doves, so behind you on this firing line is a, is a big wash. It's full of salt cedars and, and some mesquite and some other things. And, and it, as it happens, the doves were in there. And so what Holly and I did is we just scrambled. We scrambled, we got into the arroyo and, and we found that line. And yeah, you had to go, you know, running up and down things that would have been flooded during the monsoon season yeah. to find your dove, but it was so much fun. The, uh, like we were going to get double limits, except for we had to catch a plane. So oh, I think I ended man. up with twelve and Holly with ten. Yeah. And uh, but it was just, uh, it was so much fun, and it was just nobody else around. Cool. Yeah. No, I I the Yuma opener experience. Everyone, if you like shooting doves, you you got to go try it. I and actually designed a dish that's in my new book. I off know. that Trip. I saw that. The, I, the, I was looking at that. Yeah. Can can we plug that book? Like, let's try to plug it like eight or ten times in this <laughs> okay. podcast. It, it's what's the new one called? Pheasant quail cottontail. cottontail. Pheasant quail cottontail. And it's everything small game. So it's not just those three animals. Right. It's it's if it's smaller than a you know it's so it's, it's turkeys, it's rabbits and and hares and quail and partridges and grou all the grouse. Right. And and uh, we're. Holly and I are super, super proud of it. This is our, it's, our, it's kind of the end of the trilogy. So we started with a duck and goose book. Yep. Then we did a venison book. And now we have a small game book. Yep. And it's, it's the biggest book yet. So it's 336 pages. Wow. It's hardcover. It's full color. There's probably 300 illustrations and, and photographs in it. There's 130 some odd recipes for you, you name it. Yeah. You know, if, if if it's if it crawls around or flies, there's yeah. a recipe for it. I, I like your little thing along the side where it has like little icons mm -hmm. that tell you here's the group of of small game that this recipe works for. We had to think about this a lot because if you think about it, right? So if you've got say what I like what I made today. Yeah. So what, we'll what, what do you call that that you made today? Pozole verde. Can you spell that for sure. people from my part of the world? <laughs> P O Z O L E pozole. Okay. And then verde just means green in Spanish. Okay. Um, so like, like if you've ever had pozole at a Mexican restaurant, uh, it's typically rojo. So it's typically a red pozole. Okay. And so you can either go red or green with a lot of different kinds of Mexican dishes. And, and so I have this recipe in pheasant quail cottontail, but I have it listed under pheasant because that's what I happened to make it with when I was making, designing the recipe. Uh -huh. Well, but there's no reason you couldn't use turkey or partridge or quail or cottontail rabbit, or, or really any light meat at all, including javelina. Right. Uh, and so what we did is we designed this series of icons that are the icons, uh, it's an image of every different chapter 
This is, well, okay, so if you want to make fazole, but you don't happen to have pheasant kicking around, but you've got wild turkey, or you've got rabbit, or you've got squirrel, or you've got partridges or quail, you can use that. And it's right. a very quick indicator that, so, so in other words, so like there might be 25 turkey recipes, but there's really more like 100 because turkey is applicable to so many of these other yeah. other dishes, and and that was a that was something that, that's new for this book that was not in other books. Yeah, no, it's helpful for a guy like me because I'm I'm like really simple. So you know, like anything that you can't just can we tell them about what you guys did to my to my. <laughs> Uh, taco seasoning. <laughs> so I'm talking about simple, right? So I show up here. I'm thinking Hank's not getting here until a couple nights later. And usually the crew is like, well, Randy's going to throw something together really quick. So when we're out in like camp, camp out in the woods, Usually it is some sort of venison burger with McCormick's mild taco sauce, some shredded cheese, some lettuce, some flour tortillas. There you go, guys. Deal with it. Well, I showed up here with a whole bags of stuff that we bought. And Jonathan, I can tell something's wrong. He looks at this these two packages. <laughs> And then he pulls my buddy Wade. Wade and I, we've known each other for 30-some years. He pulls him aside, and he's showing these packages to Wade, and they're whispering something. <laughs> and I'm like, well, hell with them. You know, if they want to cook, they can cook. So Hank shows up last night, and Jonathan shows him these packages of McCormick's mild, what is it, taco, taco seasoning. seasoning. And I'm the brunt of their humor for most of the day <laughs> to the point where they took me outside over lunch today and built a fire and said, here's what you do with this stuff. And they threw my mild taco seasoning <laughs> on the fire. Hey, when you grow up among Finns and Norwegians and Swedes, that's pretty serious sauce. There, you know? <laughs> so, we, we gave it the, well, the cleansing fire well, of purification. Right. <laughs> you, so that's the thing. Randy, I mean, it, you know, it was great. I, I, I loved making the tacos because you're like, hey, man, you know, just, just something fast and easy. I figured, all right, you know, taco night's pretty good. And I, I see those seasoning packets and I'm just, uh, it, so it's just, it's one of those, I'm like, we're in Arizona of all places. Right? We're almost and, in Mexico. And, uh, to we're sitting to per, like yeah, 20 miles from Mexico. To, to preserve <laughs> the sanctity of, of this food, we brought in flour torts. So what was even funnier was, so when, when I met up with Marcus and Michael and, and Kara when they were here, uh -huh. um, I, you know, they, as they'll tell you, I, I'm a big fan of breakfast burritos. You yeah. see me in the kitchen I every see, morning. I see that, yeah. And if, if we could just wrap everything in a tortilla, a flour tortilla, everything would be fine. Okay. Um, all the world's problems would be solved. Everyone just <laughs> eats these. And so, um, you know, we, we were having tacos before the, when they were down yeah. one night and, uh, they grabbed the flour tortillas and threw them on their plate and, you know, we're, we're getting ready to start, you right. know, dishing up and I'm like going, hold on, hold on, hold on. Right. We're in Sonoran land, the, the, the home of where flour tortillas developed. And we have to preserve the sanctity of this. Okay. And I said, give me your tortillas. And they all give me this strange look. Like why? Why is he taking our tortillas? They were going to eat them cold. I'm like, right. no, we have we have we, hot we tortillas do it that here. way up north. Right. We have to. You have because it's to, cold up there. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to toast these tortillas so that way it's it's I nice and malleable. That. So they're actually flexible. Yeah, they're flexible. They're <laughs> right. malleable. They don't rip apart on you. But it's it's a, and it adds a little bit of flavor to them. And then um, you brought this taco seasoning, and I was like, I can't bring myself to put I, this packet on meat to serve in a tortilla. This just can't. I'm like. I'm willing to make do with whatever I can find, and so I ran and up to the. And you did a damn good I, job. I ran up to the, mar the market, I, and I'm like, man, I, I, okay, what's here? Let me see what I've got. I got to get some onion, need some stuff. I'm like, we'll we'll make tacos. You, you know, that's it. why I call them Aravaca tacos because I still didn't have a full suite of ingredients. But I'm like, I'm going to make this happen. So. And, and you did, and nobody had an instant gut ache. <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> That's the, the, usually the revenge of the, of the mild uh, taco mix in the foil. Exactly. You, know? you try to get the camera crew up and moving before daylight, and they're all over, oh. Wow. Ooh, oh, boy. Where's the GP? <laughs> oh, boy. So no, I didn't notice that as a lingering problem from your taco style. That's so right. Yeah, it was, uh, I, 
you know, all I could equate it to, folks, is like if you brought beer to an AA meeting or something. I mean, it, it was like really a violation of all. all it was all, all things holy. This yeah, is, I mean, you know. It was like 1972 called Wanted It's Seasoning Back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I'm never gonna live it down, folks. But no, we're gonna. What, what, if, if you see Randy anywhere and any personal appearance that he makes, you need to give him a packet of McCormick's Mild Taco Seasoning. There you go. <laughs> and if these guys come to my camp anytime that, and they ask me to cook, they're gonna get tacos. Do you really McCormick? think that I, if I'm in your camp, that I'm going to ask you to cook? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I hope not, Hank. I really hope not, because I... Mean, I, I may not be I mean, as good a hunter as you, but I can uh, cook. Well, you, you are... You definitely have proven the, that talent on many occasions. I'm, I'm sure they don't ask you to write those books because you have Randy Newberg's culinary skills. <laughs> I, I mean, what I do isn't even... It doesn't reach the point of being falling under the category of culinary. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, but you know, in all honesty, I'm an, I'm an ignoramus with a bow, so yeah, it well, evens out. <laughs> I, I guess we all have our thing. My my wife, she puts me in charge of fish. Ah, okay. So, so your kitchen do I like? Yeah, 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 Dara, you bet. <laughs> and uh, everybody who's eaten walleyes that I cook seems to like them. But and you bread you them have, or you beer batter them? Bread them. They're also good. Yeah. Bread them with lots of spices. I mean, almost enough that your nose runs as bad as mine is running with this Las Vegas <laughs> bug here. And uh, so my wife put, always puts me in charge of the fish. But I'm like a fish snob that if it isn't prepared, exa- I mean, when I say prepared, I mean like filleted exactly the way I like it, every bone removed the way I like it. I, I, I'm like, I don't know that I can eat this. And to the point where I think people are like, well, if you don't like it, you do it then. Yeah. You know? Okay. Fine. You know, for years, people, I've gotten that. Like, well, if you don't like it, you do it. And then, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, Jonathan brought out the crane bacon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yesterday. Tell me what crane bacon is. So, because if you left the plate on the table and everybody else could had left the room the one person in the room would eat the whole damn plate <laughs> and probably lick right. the plate with what little seasoning might be there well so uh, we talked last time about sandhill crane hunts in arizona i know and, and you'd, you haven't invited me well, I, I tried. <laughs> you have a busy schedule. Have you been invited, Hank? Not to that. There I, was a, there was I a, shoot him in a, a Oklahoma or, Can, or a Kansas or Texas. Oh, you haven't invited me there. I can get the hint. Hey, you're afraid <laughs> I'm going to show up with my McCormick's mild taco seasoning. <laughs> oh, actually, what we both should be afraid of is Mr. Big Boy with this Bertha gun. Tell, ask him about the gun he shoots cranes with. <laughs> I, he was telling me about that. He's got a 10-gauge, right? some sort of long tom <laughs> With operation. like, like five-inch shells or something crazy yeah. like that? <laughs> like a big old punt gun they had back in the market shooting days or If something. you guys don't know Jonathan, Jonathan is a large mammal. Yeah. <laughs> he can yeah. shoot the 10-gauge and not yeah. die. And so yeah. the fact that my gun weighs 12 pounds really doesn't bother me. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, but so we, we talked about it in the last time you were down and... Uh, about Sandhill Crane Hunt, and you're like, oh, you know, and it's kind of interesting, and I'm like, I'm trying to entice you to come down because it's pretty mm-hmm. spectacular, but I knew you hadn't had Sandhill Crane before. I had never And had. a lot of the other folks, you know, who are down here this week hadn't had Sandhill Crane before either, so I said, all right, well, uh, you know, I'd planned on doing some crane bacon, but I was like, you know, the, the first night I was like, I want, I, want, I want everyone to taste it the way it is naturally. Because yeah. it really is surprising how much it doesn't taste like a duck or goose. Is right. you know, it's a dark red meat, but it's not, not that same flavor at all. So I just went out, started up some mesquite coals, a little salt and pepper, seasoned it, and then I made a little two berry sauce with some of the stuff we had in the fridge, oh, man, and just uh, set on the table I'm like here, you know, just have a try what it is naturally. Because before that, you know, you, it's you know, it's very shocking when you when you eat it and you go, man, this this doesn't taste like any duck or goose I've ever had. Right. It's beefy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. I mean, it's it's why they call it the ribeye in the sky. Yeah. There's a, there's a reason why ribeye in the sky. Is that what they call sand hills? Yeah. So then it was like, all right, um, you know, there's a really this is this is just a super quick minimal ingredients making some charcuterie. 
Um, you know, I don't personally like most of the time I don't use Morton's tender quick. It's kind of like I've had a bag in the, in the cupboard and it's, it's always there, but it's, I, I like Hank would, you know, I'll be personally mixing my own spice and blend and, you know, trying to get it just right and stuff. But this was a pretty easy way of just, you know, a 50, 50 mix of, of Morton's tender quick and brown sugar. And, um, you know, letting it sit in that, uh, just really coating it really well, had a lot of extra, keep it in a bag for about 10 to 12 hours, pull it out, rinse all what's left off. It, it, it extracts some moisture out of there, but it adds a lot of that, the sweetness and the saltiness. And then once I've got it all rinsed off, pat it dry, hit it up with a little bit of black pepper, some coarse ground black pepper, and then smoked it with pecan wood until it reached about 145 degrees. Pulled it off, slice it thin. It's great to eat straight off the smoker or, you know, I had them in the refrigerator, pulled them out, we eat them cold. And then I actually, you know, I cooked some up tonight, get them uh, with a little bit of butter to reheat it so you can see what that, that what it tastes like when it's hot and moist and all that. Yeah. And it's, it's such a surprising flavor um, that it has and it, and it works so well. Uh, with that bird, it's kind of like, oh, this was this was kind of just an easy way to, to throw some things together. I've done it a whole lot more fancy with pink salt, number one, and, and you know, getting some herbs and, and spices and things in there. But this was just kind of a quick and dirty, hey, they've never had crane. Let's, let's you know, let them see what, what you can really do with this really cool bird. So well, um, everybody was very impressed, such that they asked for more tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but your limit is what, three cranes? So, yeah, we're, we're west of uh, I-25. Um, which is, runs north-south through New Mexico. Yeah. Uh, Arizona is just a special place for, for these Santa Cranes as well as New Mexico. It's, it's where the Rocky Mountain and mid-continent populations cross. And so we have to be a little bit extra careful, careful with the Rocky Mountain population because there's a whole lot less of them than there are the mid-continents. And um, so uh, out here, it's, it's three birds. Per year. Um, that's our maximum per the year, and that's it. Yeah. Once you get east of I-25, out in Texas and Oklahoma and all, and the east side, of it's three per day. Three um, a day? Yeah, mm -hmm. with a possession limit of They got that many cranes over in that part? Oh, There's a half a million birds in the mid-continent population. Yes, um, and so in the Rocky Mountain population, there's only right now about 27, 28,000. Huh. Um, so vastly different numbers. Right. Um, but it's, yeah, so it's... They are fiendishly difficult to hunt in the mid-continent. Because of hunting pressure? Fiendishly. Because they're hunting pressure for one. They live forever. And they, they travel in family groups. Yeah. So chances are that if you've got a bunch of cranes flying over your head, somebody has been hunted many, many times. So they can be just brutal. I mean, it's like I, I've, I've, you know, it's fair. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a fair, you know, it's, it's, you don't want to talk about fair chase. You know, you're, talk, you're, you're chasing a very charismatic, very difficult, very bright bird. And uh, it's actually a very controversial bird to hunt. Um, I really? think, I think there are because more, of all those things you just mentioned. No, it's because um, cranes hold cultural weight in the way that very few other animals that we hunt hold. Tell me. Um, so cranes, in many cultures, are a symbol of longevity. They're a symbol of. Uh, they take the place of the, sw the swan as a bird of love in, in Europe and, and in many other cultures, cranes are that. And then you add to that that, the, yes, they do mate for life, as do vultures. Um, the fact that there's this, there's this hooping crane out there, out there that people um, conflate with, with sandhills. So they think that if you're a crane hunter, you're shooting an endangered species, which is mm. not, not correct. Right. Um, but, but if you know, if you just know that, oh, there's that crane that you saw on that TV show that one time that's endangered. And then you hear that, you know, this guy, Jonathan's shooting this, this same kind of bird. Oh, he must be a horrible person. And, um, that happens with cranes and it happens with doves a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. Michigan had a dove season and then they lost it they because did. of the social, mm -hmm. whatever. Iowa just got their dove season back in the last couple of years because um, they had, had not had it for a long time. Um, so dove hunting just in Iowa just wasn't, you know, the thing for most folks. And How big are cranes? I've, I've never well, shot a, one. There's so a greater yeah. and a lesser. The greater, sir, you don't want to face them in a dark alley. Really? I, how far, I mean, you'd say yeah, so they, five um, feet tall? No, they're, they're, they have about a uh, six to almost seven foot wingspan. 
right. but uh, get about yeah four feet. Um, you know they're they're pushing pretty tall, uh, and average weights that I saw. I mean the big birds. It's funny when so uh, we ran a check station this year, which we do every third year. Um, and you can always tell as soon as the guy grabs the bird to bring it up to the table, um, if he's holding the feet at like, you know, head level and the head's still dragging on the ground, you're like, oh, that's a greater and a lesser, you know, it, the head would be kind of swinging about where his knees at. Huh. Um, and so the big birds like that are about 13 pounds, um, 12, 13 pounds. They're, they're, they're a hefty bird. Um, and then the lessers range from uh, about seven or eight pounds, uh, on average. Hmm. Um, as a whole bird. Yeah. Um, but you know, and I, I love to, I usually the, you know, the turkey hunters are like, Oh, we shoot the biggest game bird. And I'm like, well, technically if you look at measurement, yeah, it might be a little heavier, but this is taller. This is bigger wingspan and, and things like that with the graders. New Zealand black swans can run over 25 pounds. Well, and yeah, we're, <laughs> we're talking about America here, Hank. We're not going to New Zealand, but, and, and, and Hank's absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, of, uh, uh, things that people, you know, they believe about cranes. And that's one of the things that it's always been a point of pride for Arizona because um, crane hunting has been going on since 1961 in the United States. Uh, and the Pacific Flyway, Arizona was the first state. Okay. Um, we started our hunt in 81. New Mexico followed us in 82 um, with these hunts. And, and because we had a much smaller population of these, these Rocky Mountains, and it was much lower um, even back then. Yeah. And... Um, and so we've always touted it in the Pacific Flyway. This is like a crown jewel bird because we proved you could you could manage a species that has this longevity, um, you know, with hunting as a part of it. Yeah. Um, and and so you know, in years past, in those early years, it was very funny. You read the early management plans and things, and and they were setting, um, you know, floors, um, a, a baseline bottom, like where we wanted the population to get to number wise. And now we're sitting in the flyway and there's so many, we're setting ceilings saying, okay, we got to back them off a little bit because, you know, you get a bunch of cranes, they'll tear up some fields pretty darn quick. Um, And so the farmers get kind of mad at us. And and so we're trying to keep that happy balance between the floor and the ceiling there. And, um, but there's, there's been a lot of consternation with it uh, over the years. I mean, I remember when I first started with the department, um, uh, Earth First, used to show up to our, our commission meetings when we'd set the hunting regulations for cranes and, and, you know, they didn't like it and all that. And, you know, it was kind of like, well, it's, you know, they're, like I said, it's, it's, we've always treated it. It's kind of our crown jewel to be able to show, yes, we can, we can really manage these birds for the long term. Yeah. Um, and it, there are some features that people find, you know, the, the, the whole mating for life thing. That's always, right. it's a, it's a romantic ideal we have, um, that, that, you know, goes on and, and stuff. And the more I'm learning about several species, um, about how the, the monogamy maybe may not be, you know, quite, especially, especially ones, uh, birds and things that have a lot of offspring Yeah. that, that it's not as clean as you might think it is Oh yeah. in terms of the genetics have of who read, the father is. Have you read is. Bernd Heinrich's stuff? Yeah, there's famous, yeah. famous naturalist who who's did seminal work about geese, um, and like so, geese of course you know are known to mate for life as well. Eh, except they don't. Um, there's divorce in the goose world. <laughs> there's there's adultery in the goose world, um, and it's it's the more it's what Jonathan's saying. Like the more you learn about actual bird behavior, the more like there's two things that are interesting. One is like, well, this whole mate for life thing is. A little bit overblown, but the really deeper piece that has just got me endlessly fascinated is the more you look at bird behavior, the more you realize they're not that much different from us. You know, bird bird intelligence is way higher than we would have even dreamed of ten years ago. So the old ago. idea of a bird brain is, is wrong. Okay, and it's and it, we've only known this so over the last. 10, 15 years, even five years, you know, the, the, the research that's going on with corvids, you know, crows and ravens and, and jays and magpies and things is just astounding. Like, so huh. crows, if you're mean to a crow, so if you're, if you shoot crows or if you're nasty to crows, right, the rest of the crows are going to mark you. They're going to know that Randy Neuberg is mean to crows. And what's worse Every crow in that area is, first of all, is going to know that Randy Newberg's mean to crows. So they're going to start yelling at you. They're going to track you to make sure that you don't get near other crows. And they will tell their kids that Randy Newberg is mean to crows. 
You're kidding me. I am not kidding you. This is a, this is a true fact. Yep. And, <laughs> and so, so they did this, wow. most of this research in Toronto and in the University of Washington, where they had like a, like a Neanderthal mask. So everybody who had to climb up to a crow's nest, like banned the little chicks. And it's kind of traumatic. Like you're grabbing this chick and the mom is scrocking and all this kind of stuff. So they'd wear this Neanderthal mask. And so to do their work, generations after, generations of crows, after they stopped using that mask, anybody walking around the University of Washington campus with that mask would get mobbed by crows. <laughs> Yeah, they actually physically remember your face. Yep. I remember really? as a kid, oh, yeah, my dad used to love out in Montana shooting crows, and and we'd head out to the dump, local dump, and there'd be crows out there. And it was, they hated him. You know, as soon as he'd come out, I mean, it was just a big ruckus <laughs> that he was there. <laughs> That's crazy. And he would change vehicles, change clothes, and it was, I could never figure it out. I'm like going, I'm like, Dad, man, the crows are just, they... They really just start firing up when Bad you show up. Bad luck to shoot and, a crow. Huh. So. How many different species of birds have you guys eaten? A These lot. too many oh. to count. But I won't, I won't shoot crows. Okay. Really? Nope. It's bad luck to shoot a crow. They're just I like them. They're, they're kind of my friends. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, I've, I've, que I've done the quail slam, so I've shot yeah. every quail in America. There's six species. Um, I've got all but two grouse so missing the rock and the willow ptarmigan um i've got you know obviously pheasants and huns and chuckers and, and turkeys i don't have all the subspecies of turkeys yet yeah. I've, i still need a couple of them um uh, doves all three kinds of doves uh common pigeons bantail pigeons um uh swans in utah um all the geese all the ducks um, I'm missing like, I think I'm missing like four ducks that, that you can get in North America. Yeah. So it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I've, this guy here sitting next to me is the only known human to have done the squirrel slam, <laughs> That's right. but I'm intending to be the second guy to do that. And what's more, I'm probably, the squirrel if, slam. if I put my work, if I put my mind to it within a couple of years, I might. I might have every legal small game animal in the U.S. and Canada under my belt. Wow. I'm about f 12 or 14 species away. <laughs> That's interesting. Isn't it cool? Because you hear everyone else talk about, what is it, the North American 29 right? or some crazy. Huh? Oh, it's like 75 or 80 small game species. That is something to aspire to. Yeah. So, Jonathan, I know you've shot a whole gamut of birds also and the reason i ask the question is is there one that you say this rises to the top and one that is Look, always at the bottom Jonathan, go first yeah you know i'm <laughs> I, I tell you what it's i just i get so jazzed because it and that's it as hank said there's so many species there's there's never a dull moment beginning september 1st until Sometime, well, here for here in Arizona until sometime in February. I've got a really nice long season with a lot of things in between. And then turkey starts up in the spring. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah when does so, your turkey season start here? Uh, March? Usually late April. March, early April. Yeah, You've like got goulds here, right? Yeah, we have the, the th we have three um, of the subspecies. Merriam's, um, Rio Grande, and goulds? Yep. Because then you have uh, um, Eastern's, Osceola's. And then the only other one you have to get is the uh, the oscillated down in Yucatan or Guatemala. Yeah. But when are you um, gonna get when are you gonna get Merriam's elk back here? Merriam's elk? Yeah. Oh, it's a whole other story. <laughs> we got we got Rocky Mountains. There's plenty of them. Okay. Just um, kidding. Because weren't they supposedly like these? Yeah. One, one notch bigger than Rocky Mountain. Now? Yeah. Oh, wow. A lot of it <laughs> are now gone. But anyhow, didn't mean to. No, it's it's good, but so it's. I kind of hear this. What, 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 I mean, like for me personally, I, I can tell you that that once I st once I started crane hunting, um, I, it was just amazing to me, and I didn't I didn't have a mentor who brought me into this, and I had to learn it from scratch from the from the very bottom. I don't know what I'm doing. I own a gun and a, and tags for these birds. I've never hunted before. 
and they they super eyesight and all kinds of weird different things I got to figure out. Um, and so over the past, I guess, 12 years, I've been hunting these things. Um, you know, I, I started to learn, I'm like, every year I learn something new about these things, how to set up, how, you know, something about the birds, something about the wind, the weather. And so I, I'm now to the point, you know, I'm, I, I, like I said, it's, if, if you're a crane hunter, you're always going to be a crane. There's, you have to jump in both feet and it's just, it's never ending. And, you know, here in Arizona, like I said, I get three birds. That's it. That's my whole year for Arizona. And so my life revolves around that crane hunt. Yeah. Like I, I, everything else gets planned around it pretty much. You know, it's like, I, I got to get drawn, got to get my three birds. Cause it's just those three days. And, and now that I've, I've mentored some new guys into it and, you know, I said, look, it's, you know, I've, I brought you into this. There's a lot of stuff I learned about these things that, that you don't have to learn the hard way. Yeah. You know, let me show you how this works and stuff. But I, I and so they really enjoy it. They're, they've been bit by this bug. And so we all go out now and it's just crane camp is a big party for us for about a week to 10 days, um, mm -hmm. breakfast every morning. You know, we're, we're, we're doing it. We're doing it upright. Cause then once the cranes are done, we're chasing doves. It's quail season. It's duck season. You know, we're, we're making a full go of it. So for me, I'd say, I'd say, you know, cranes are definitely top of my list. Um, in terms of the overall birds. Um, and if there isn't one at the bottom, that's fine too. No, and I, and I honestly don't have a bottom one. I mean, um, doves are always a high priority for me. It's just, it's way too much fun. Yeah. Um, especially <laughs> here are. in Arizona because there's so many. Yeah. Um, I always want to, you know, get some white wings from that early season before they head off down to Mexico. And then it's morning dove season the rest of the time. And it's really funny to watch the shift between early season, that first 15 days we have with resident birds, the birds are here. And then the second season with these, these birds from up north where they don't have the same patterns. They don't, you know, and, and they're a little tougher to figure out sometimes. And so I kind of like that challenge, but yeah, I mean, I've got, geez, I've got three quail I can hunt. I got Santa Cranes, the, the sporadic weirdness of how many weird, du like just what ducks are going to come up, come up next. Um, sometimes while I'm crane hunting, geese will show up. Um, and, and we're definitely not a big goose state. And so that's, always like an extra surprise in the bag for me. And I, it's, it, there's, there's definitely none at the bottom, but it's, it's enjoyable to have, I, I love that November, December time frame when everything's open all together. And it's just, you know, kind of, we kill, we shoot cranes and let's like, we, wheel of fortune, what's next? What, what are we going to go to do? You know, like, oh, we should go shoot quail. Or, oh, I saw a bunch of ducks today. Or, yeah. you know, we just, it's, it's all day. Like it's, it's such a spectacular time. So, um, and then I got to try and squeeze in my squirrel hunting, um, rabbit season, which is great here is, is, is all year round. So I've got ample opportunity to run out. This is a, a perfect time of year to, to get out because the weather's so nice. Yeah. Um, and that's what I really enjoy. Not because of the whole disease issue, weird mythology about rabbits. Huh. Um, you know, uh, people didn't pay attention to biology and, and realize <laughs> that everything grows in the summer, including parasites. In the winter time, they're like, "Oh, you know, only shoot them in months at NNR or after the first right. snow or frost." And it's like, "Okay, well, so you're eating eggs that you can't see. That that must feel really good, you know. <laughs> you, you haven't really thought this through, so, so yeah. But it, trying to squeeze it all in in a year, it's with small game. It's 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 just open door, yeah. You know, and and I like that it's it has that, with the exception of cranes, where it's kind of tied to an area. Um, I. It, pheasants a lot harder to get here in arizona yeah. that draw has just been you know mystifying to me i've i think i've been drawn once in five years huh. um and it's it, in human it's hot it's when it's right after dove season so it's still burning hot like you is yeah and uh I, I love those birds and it's such a rare kind of unique opportunity for arizona but um and of course we have chucker and we have you know blue grout i'm like i always get stymied like man i'm, I'm running out of time to go get these things so <laughs> So you deferred, Hank. What's your... Well, I'll say, you know, I come at it from a cook's perspective. Um, from a cook's perspective, I think, and from a hunter's perspective. I mean, I could be argue, you know, you could argue me away on some of it on the hunter's perspective, but the, the duo of rough grouse and woodcock in the northern forests is 
I'd say always. That's that's the top of the list. There you go, folks. You people wonder why I have this problem with rough grouse. You just heard it from the man himself <laughs> that my insanity, my whatever you want to call it, when I see a rough grouse, everything shuts down. Oh, absolutely. I, I am like one-dimensional until that grouse is either dead or so far gone that I <laughs> give up all hope. I mean, so the, the, the reason why I'm going to say roughies over blue grouse, yeah. which are arguably tastier than rough grouse, is that it's not easy in most places to shoot a limit of blue grouse. Um, there are plenty of places and people are like, oh, I shoot them with, you know, rocks. I kill them with rocks when I'm elk hunting. Yeah, you can sometimes. But if you go to a place where, where blue grouse are actually hunted, they're, again, they're like we were talking about cranes. They they get fiendishly squirrely. Yeah. So the amount of, it, it's, it, it's just much a more pleasant experience to be in the Minnesota Northwoods chasing woodcock and rough grouse and then at the end of that day i mean i can't think of a pair of birds that are better on the table than those two yeah now as far as a bad bird that one's easy and jonathan was just demurring it's a merganser yeah there's nothing worse than a merganser right <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. Yeah. Flying fish. Yeah, it's just right. um, bad I, fish. I have been fortunate enough to have never shot a merganser. I did. Uh, so Holly has shot several by mistake. Right. Uh, and if she was here, she'd tell you that I tricked her into shooting one once, um, <laughs> which isn't totally true. I just took a shot at a bird I wasn't totally identified, and she hit hers, and I didn't hit mine, and it happened to be a big, giant, common merg drake. <laughs> <laughs> so she got it mounted, and its name is Chico. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I shot one, and I just wanted to try it. Oh, and I've only shot one. Oh, yeah. Just not... Like, could I make... Knives. Could I... It's like, if you put a gun to my head and said, make merganser taste good, sure, I can do it. I have that... I have I have Jedi powers. I'd have to use them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I am so glad to hear you say rough grouse. Because... So, here's kind of... This is just... A, you know, earlier we were talking about these... Uh, uh, kind of unique cultures within states. Mm -hmm. So here's a unique culture to nor part of northern Minnesota, which I think is the rough grouse capital of the planet. Uh, mm. If there's a place with better Can rough Canada has some better spots. Okay, but Minnesota, like if I were to tell someone who wanted to go to the to the to the United States to hunt rough grouse, I'm going to send them to northern Minnesota or the UP. Okay. Yeah. For sure. I'm, I'm going to send them to Kuchiching or St. Louis County in Northern Where's Minnesota. Where's Bidette? Bidette is on Lake of the Woods County. Okay. Yeah, it's the birthplace of Randy Newberg, but... No way, uh, really? I was born in Bidette. Oh, yeah. damn. I've shot a lot so, of grouse in Bidette. So you, come, you come south of Bidette. Well, you can't go north of Bidette. You're in Canada. Yeah, but well, if you, you come just need south, a passport. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the country I'm talking about. You yeah. come south, that's Pine it, Island It's State pretty Forest. epic. I mean, yeah. it's... Remember I was telling you a couple days ago, like uh, like oh like when you're up there rough grouse hunting and occasionally you see like, that big ass, you know German shepherd that's actually a timber wolf. Yeah, like that's happened to us a couple of times. Oh, yeah. so you're like, whoa, that's a wolf. You yeah, know? but nobody I knew hunted woodcock. They were everywhere. Really? But that was like a waste of ammunition. Michigan's the same way. Uh, it was like, you must, my, my dad would say, you from Massachusetts? You, you hunt woodcock? That that was his example. For That's some funny. reason, my friends in Massachusetts are obsessed with woodcock. Yeah, I, and I I yeah. just thought my dad wanted to pick on people from Massachusetts. Well, it's, he's, you know, he's like <laughs> only Massachusetts guys shoot them. And then if anyone showed up with fancy dogs and a, a, a side by side or over and oh, under, and leather on their uh, on their yeah, elbows, those were city slickers. <laughs> and yeah. city slickers were anyone south of Highway Two, which is the highway of northern Minnesota that goes it from is. Duluth to Grand Forks. It does. If you were south of that, you were a city slicker, and you were the guys with the fancy dogs who flushed them and didn't shoot them on stumps, didn't shoot them on the skid trails or whatever. I need to say for the record that I am not above the skillet shot. <laughs> I, 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 so I was on Ron's podcast. Have you been on? By Ronnie Vame? Yeah. Yeah. 
So he had me on his podcast because he's heard me talk about this stuff. He's like, yeah, I'm going to offend the sensibilities of every one of my listeners, Randy. <laughs> but I want you to talk about how you grew up with this grouse passion and you shoot them anywhere, anyhow. And, and it was they're delicious. That, that was it. <laughs> it was food to us. These were like wild chickens or yeah. wild whatever. And if you came home with three, four, however many grouse the limit was that year, you were like, you probably got to stay up late and watch, you know. Johnny some, Carson or something. Yeah, yeah. Some, some crazy movie <laughs> that night or something, you know. Or you weren't grounded. A, a good way to end being grounded is to show up with four grouse. Ah, that's and good. And you would shoot them. I, if you shot them on the fly, that was the worst of all outcome because, first of all, you're probably going to miss. Second of all, you're going to get pellets in the breast, <laughs> which was right up there with missing, almost as bad as missing. So if, if you went to buy a shotgun, like I bought mine at the, when the Kmart was still there in International Falls, you looked at this big rack. They were all Remington 870 Wingmasters mm. with 28-inch barrels. And full chokes. And you'd think those guys were all goose hunters or yeah. something. Yeah. No. Those were grouse guns. You could take their head off at 30 yards with that set. <laughs> you couldn't find an improved cylinder or a modified choke. That was what those guys down That's south hilarious. used. That's <laughs> hilarious. And, uh, no, I, and then in the, you know... If you got the this calendar dates of when season would open are always like the third Saturday in September or whatever. And sometimes you'd luck out and it'd slide five or six days early. And those young of the year, if you had a really good hatch, they'd all be clutched up with with mom. And you'd come around the corner in the skid trail, there'd be eight grouse sitting there in one little I've seen that in Vidette. Yeah. And they'd all be plucking clover, and you'd kind of line up how yeah. <laughs> how many could you get, and you'd let drive there, and there'd just be a three is my record. Yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I, killed dead. I don't know if I ever got three, but cripples and, and wounded ones I had to polish off is a pretty good handful every once in a while. And so, so I'm on Ron's podcast okay. and he is roaring, laughing. And I'm thinking, <laughs> is he laughing because this is funny or because he's going to lose all of his listeners yeah. and he's trying to figure out <laughs> what kind of, Let's how's he going to respond to all this hate mail? <laughs> so I told him I'll take full credit or full blame, whichever you want to point my direction, but it's rough grouse. Oh yeah. So Wisconsin apparently is this weird hotbed of rough grouse. Of, so, you know, I will say, yeah, I got three rough grouse. I'm super stoked. And all my Scotty buddies would be like, yeah, you know, I shot five. Again? Yeah, I always shoot five. Like, where? In Wisconsin. Like, <laughs> where? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> like, so apparently there's some amazing secret grouse holes in up in the trees, up by like Rhinelander and stuff. Probably. And... Like, I need to find these places. Yeah. Like, a really, like, like it's one of my bucket list things is to, you know, because you know I went to the University of Wisconsin. Right. So yeah. it's, it's one of my, it's a bucket list thing for me to actually shoot a five bird limit of rough grouse in Wisconsin. I've yeah. never done it. Really? Yeah. That's too bad. So I, the, I, I am a, an ambassador for the Kuching County Tourism uh, Bureau. I, it's epic. I, I'm hunting. telling people if you like Big Falls, where I grew up, this mm -hmm. town is now 200 people, is right dead center in the middle of Kuchiching County. It, it's the only place in Minnesota that's 40 miles from anywhere. <laughs> I mean, there, there's nothing. And it is such unbelievable grouse hunting. We, we took it for granted. We just thought everybody went out after school and shot a limit of grouse or yeah. went out Saturday morning and shot a limit of grouse. Well, my friend Niskanen, he's from Deer River. Yeah. My brother lives in Deer River. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it, my brother, he's always shooting grouse. But now, so it got too easy. So now he's got one of these dogs with the big beard. You can't even Oh, remember. like a Griffon? Ah, uh, Griffon or Poodle what's Pointer? He, no, not a poodle player. Uh, what's the other what's one? The other one? Uh, yeah, a Griffon. I Griffon, think. Yeah. yeah. They look like wizards. Yeah. Yeah. And now he shoots them on the fly. I'm like, well, yeah. give me a break. I'll shoot a grouse on the fly if it's flying. But why <laughs> until you've got until you've got your possession limit? 
you should not be shooting them on the fly. I mean, sometimes they fly before you can shoot them on the ground. <laughs> then you shoot them on the fly. Well, only then. That's like the <laughs> that's the ejection seat, man. That's the last resort. And so he invites me. Oh, you got to come back. Well, partridge hunting, they call it there. It's not really. Gross, huh? See, that's a New England term. No, I look at the Minnesota regulations. It used to say partridge season regulations, really? not rough grouse. If that's the other thing, my dad. If you came up and said we're grouse hunting. My dad would roll as, you know, he'd be driving down the road, he'd roll his window down. Uh, he had to talk to everybody, usually to see if they you had a free that's beer a good to give idea? them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> if they said they're grouse hunting, he'd just kind of drift off in his truck, rolling his window up. He'd look over at his kids, city slickers. These are partridge. <laughs> I, I mean, they're so. So I, New England is a partridge. Really? Yeah. That's a New England thing. That's a serious New England thing. Huh. Like and then it's a it's a rough grouse, but they also it's a partridge. So this year we did we posted a YouTube video and I get more views or close to as many views on my grouse hunting videos as I get on my elk hunting videos. And I don't know if it's just like I'm just gonna say it right here. Yeah. I'd rather eat grouse than elk. Oh, me too. Yeah. If I could shoot, we said this earlier. And I think Jonathan would agree. So, so someone said it earlier <laughs> today. If you could shoot a 300 pound grouse, oh yeah, how cool would that all day be? long. Oh, my goodness, that would be... I mean, you might need a 270 worth, so, or a Remington Ultra Mag. But. Whatever. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty convinced that if civilization started on this side of the world versus the African continent, uh -huh. I think we'd, we'd all be raising domestic grouse instead of chickens. Uh, I, I'm, I'm there with you. They Maybe. would have figured out a way. Maybe. I mean, because you know, I mean, I don't want to get into the the, the, <laughs> sure. the biology of what can be tamed and what can't be tamed, but uh, but like, there's a reason we don't ride zebras, right? You know, I mean, maybe there's something about the grouse that is inherently wild. Let me have my dream. All right, I just want my dream. <laughs> That's fair. I think I, I just I just want to like just imagine my backyard coop like with full of blue grouse going. Yep, you can do that with truckers. Yes, you can. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah. Well, this year. My one day of Montana archery elk hunting got seriously sidetracked by I hit the rough grouse. Blue, uh, roughs or blues? Oh, roughs. Yeah. I, to me, I've had bad luck shooting some of these old male blue grouse, and they're on the tough side. Ah, if you I, get the, 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 I shot one that was two and a half pounds, plucked and gutted and rose, looked like a chicken, looked yeah. exactly like a chicken. Mm -hmm. Grouse Savan, like a, it's, it's a French. French, like Cocovan is the French stew. It's, oh. it's, it's been done for 2,000 years. Okay. It's basically chicken and red wine, but it's always an old rooster. Oh. So if you substitute a big old blue grouse, like a big boomer, yeah. and you do the same recipe with it, it's money. Okay. Well, that's where I went wrong. <laughs> yeah, because... you just can't fry it like a chicken. All right. Yeah. But I very first grouse that comes by, thump, run an arrow right through a man. I'm like, now, oh, I am in this. I'm kind of ignorant about this. Like you just said, like this, you know, our, who is it who wasted 60, 60 bucks shooting cottontails? Yeah. Like, okay, so you shot an arrow at this rough grouse. Did right. you ruin your arrow? No. Okay. Uh -uh, I use these judo points. Oh, the judo points. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. And man, the, the good part is with the judo point, all you hear is brrr, how rough grouse, when you hit them, they just spin around and flap their wings on the ground. Saw two more grouse and my buddy Bart. He's dragging me along. Come on, we got to go get this elk that's bugling. And I run this one. This one rough grouse runs in the alders. I told him, go around the corner. I'll run him out to you and poleaxe him. <laughs> <laughs> he starts walking down the trail for the elk bugling, and the grouse did exactly what I told him it would do, and we didn't get it. I was pissed. I, I would be too. I went home. I said, you know what? The hell with this elk stuff. So, you, I mean, I told you earlier today that, like, our big ticket, trip this year like the one that i'm saved up all this money for and i'm really stoked about it's not a sheep hunt it's not an elk hunt it's not even an antelope hunt as much as i love antelope hunting yeah. we're going to newfoundland to chase rock ptarmigan willow ptarmigan and rough grouse and oh, snowshoe hares wow dude 25 bird limit a day when are you going I'm going in October. I can't wait to hear that story. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. I'm bringing like sounds... a giant cooler just to bring back like birds. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have rough grouse in Arizona, do you? No, no. You we, have blues, though, right? we have blues, though. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, that's too bad. I yeah, mean, I, I mean I, blues I, are a great substitute, you know, but it's, it's not quite there. Well, it's, yeah, like I said, it's a little bit. It's, so that's, to me, like... 
that's a lot of, 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 I think, a little bit of my frustration is, you know, anytime any of the, the publications or the TV show, it's always the Northwoods grass, the Northwoods grass. I've yet to be up there to, to go woodcock or, or grass. And someday I'll make it up there. And, and so I'm like, man, why can't somebody talk about bluegrass, like, you know, in, in the West? Because st- that's what I was uh, yeah. raised on. It's like high elevation. We'd see bluegrass. Okay, I'm chasing them around. And, yeah. and uh, there's such a, I mean, arguably, you know, one of the best, if not the best, tasting, you know, game bird in terms of the upland birds. It's just, I, I would agree. It's, uh, just, it's a little smoke. bit easier to get your, your limit of five roughies in yeah. the Northwoods than it is to get your three blues. Well, and, and, and so uh, there's, there's the argument of quality versus quantity right there. So, you know, I, yeah, I we get more, I but that. I think they're pretty equal. <laughs> like on the table there, those birds are pretty equal. So what, what you, you're a biologist, Jonathan, why did they split blue grouse to duskies and sooties? I actually but, know the answer to this question. You do. Uh, I, I, I'm like, I still call them blue grouse and people will correct me. Yeah. I'm like, so, you know so, what? They're blue grouse. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're, they're blue grouse. But it's, um, you know, some of it's naming. Uh, I talked about the American Ornithologist Union earlier. Right. Someone makes a push, you know, there's, in my world, in, in the biological world, it's, it's, there's lumpers and splitters. Right. And this is really what it comes down to. I mean, there, and, and I, I find it myself all the time too. Like I said, I, I'm so excited about Mexican ducks and, and everyone's like, oh no, they're just all part of it. I'm like, oh no, they really so should be different. The, your but critics are lumpers and you're a splitter when I'm, it comes well, to I, Mexican ducks. I do both. Ducks. Yeah. But I do, I was in certain cases, I'm a lumper, so I'm, so I'm a splitter and, and, uh, you know, someone makes the case, you know, with mounds of information that, oh, this is different. And, and here's why they, you know, it's the, it's the plumage coloration or it's the weights or it's the size or whatever. Um, for a long time and that we've known, um, the grouse in Arizona are actually, um, smaller than the ones you find in Utah. Um, huh. and cause we, at one point, our, our, uh, our old region two supervisor, Tom Britt, he was interested in grouse and They'd collected a bunch of wings from hunters and, and took it to the, the, the real experts at that time up there in Utah and said, hey, can you help us, you know, go through these wings and, and see what our, our composition breakdown was? And they were like, well, where's the adult wings? And we're like, what do you, he's like, what do you mean adult wings? He's like, these are all the wings. And they're like, and they started looking at them a little bit more. They're like, oh my gosh, these are like about three quarters the size of our wings. They're just, they're I like a little bit small. Bourbon's rule. Well, yeah, and it, and, it, and it could be, but it was like, you know, maybe Arizona has a different subspecies. I'm like, ah, you know, I mean, we don't need to go down that road. But yeah. It's my um, impression that sooties r- nest in trees and, and duskies or blues nest on the ground. Really? Yeah, I think there, there could be some. Huh. It's, and, you know, sooties are only on the coast. So you yeah. can find sooties as far south as Marin County um, sporadically, but really from Mendocino County... In, in California, all the way up to Alaska, right. but only on the coast. Right. You're never going to find that particular looking grouse in the Sierra Nevada or in the Rockies or further inland. Okay. So they, they actually do look different. Hmm. Uh, boy, when I'm up spring bear hunting in Alaska. Yep. Hooters. Those are sooties. Yep. I mean, all along oh, the coast. Man, I, that's a bucket list hunt for me too. Yeah. I just, I, I mean... Come on, who wouldn't want to do that? Screw the bears. I mean, I want to <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'll need to do that. I'm going to yeah. be up there again this spring. So, I, I it's don't know. Serene I just hunt they're, 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 because you have to you have to just kind of let it let it everything flow around you and figure out where where is that hooting coming from. Well, yeah, when you when your hearing's as bad as mine, <laughs> everything's to the right because it's the only ear that really works. <laughs> I'll be walking around the coast in a circle. <laughs> Oh, well, you'd yeah, find it eventually. What's that? If you keep going around in one direction, you'll find it eventually. Sooner or later, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, hey, you shot a coos deer here in Arizona. I did. Okay. Uh, Mr. Heffelfinger is going to be on this podcast in a day or two. So he yeah. wants to talk about, he wants to confirm what you said, Jonathan, that it's not coos, it's cows. Well, it's, it's cows, like house. Right. right. And not cows, like a, 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 a heifer. Plur. Right. Or, or coos. But, right. you know, the funny thing is it's, it's, uh, this is where, you know, the regionality, this is the culture, mm-hmm. um, comes into play. Uh, the fact that they say coos uh, does not bother me whatsoever. No, it's just, it's common usage. Right. Um, I take a lot of heat actually from birders 
that we still call Mern's quail, even though technically they're, I guess they're, they're supposed to be Montezumas. Huh. And so our regs actually say Montezuma or Mern's. I like the regionality because they, they're like, well, you got to remove all that stuff from everywhere. And I'm like, no, we've, I, I, I like to know when, when someone talks to me and they go, oh, we were Mern's quail hunting. I know you came to Arizona because mm-hmm. that's just an Arizona influence. We yeah. had a you, weren't hunting, you weren't hunting them in Mexico. <laughs> you weren't hunting them in, in New Mexico um, where you hear Montezuma's Montezuma. more. And so I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You were, you know, you, it's, it's just that regional colloquial, colloquialism that, you know, really, it separates areas. Um, uh, you know, it's, well, I, I really enjoy that. It, so. On this podcast, we will use interchangeably <laughs> coos and cows. Yep. So, because some guys have lit me up on, on last year when I was down here oh, yeah. doing this. Yeah, it's a and, desert whitetail. And, and yeah, <laughs> I started calling them yeah, that, Arizona right. whitetails, just because the, the Arizona guys, uh, you stupid northerner, don't you know that they're coos deer? And I'm like, I know what you guys call them. I just, you know, I got a very good history lesson from Jonathan. I went home and researched it, and guess what? Here's how it's pronounced, and you, they actually spell it out, you know, the pronunciation. But you are not going to convince your hardcore coos deer hunters down here that it is anything other than coos. Right, and, and, and the, the big thing, Elliot Coos is, Elliot Kaus is dead. Right. He's can't come back from the grave to be like, no, this is my deer. I, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and of course it was named after him. He wasn't the one that actually named it. Technically, it was Edgar Mearns who named it. Okay. In honor of, of Elliot Kaus, one of his, his mentors and, and friends. So, I, let's so anyhow, you shot one. Mm-hmm. Table fair. Quality. Remarkably, remarkably good. And so I've now eaten the meat. Uh, from four different coos deer. Okay. And the so one thing that I've noticed that is unique among this uh, on this deer, now it's a small sample, so bear with me. Yeah. But, uh, you know, with the small end number, I have noticed that the most unique thing about this deer is that the fat does not get waxy. Really? So venison fat in almost every other deer I've eaten anywhere um, to some extent is going to, as it cools, it will coat your mouth yeah. and that's unpleasant. So it doesn't, it tastes fine when it's piping hot, but as soon as it cools, you get that kind of weird waxy and it's just off putting. I did not get that at all with this coos deer. Hmm. Um, and the other thing that was fascinating about it is this deer was fat. I mean, I shot this deer, not 20 miles from where we're sitting and it was fat and there's no agriculture here. Right. I mean, we're not even remotely close to any ag. So this thing was eaten ocotillo and prickly pear and all kinds of other stuff. So it has its complete desert diet. But it's one of these things I always say is like the Sonoran Desert is one of the few places you can get fat in a desert because <laughs> there's so much to eat here. <laughs> he and must have been making a good living. He was. And it just, it was, uh, I mean, they're little deer, but. Yeah. I probably only got like, I have some left, but I probably only get maybe eight, 10 meals out of it. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more, but, um, but yeah, no teeny, but neat. It was, and it's just, and it gets you into this country and this country is really, you know, there's a reason why I've been here six times in the last 365 days. Yeah. Oh, it's a remarkable place. I, I have to ask you what kind of table fare it is because my last year of archery hunting and looking like this year's archery hunting, I'm probably not going to get a first-hand taste of... Yeah, you know, I've seen you shoot a rifle before. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I know. I know. I, I could probably get one with a rifle, well, but I wouldn't bet on this? that either. If you, if you strike out this time, mm-hmm. God forbid... Uh, it's getting very likely, but yeah, God forbid. Come back next year and stalk within a hundred yards and shoot that guy and shoot that deer in the, you know, with a rifle. Uh, you, you, It'll make yourself feel better, and you'll get to eat coos deer. You're, you're <laughs> talking my language now, Hank. I, it, it just uh, part of it is just. Well, I called my wife the other night, and she had eight inches of new wet snow. 
What is what? What are you talking about? Yeah. What, what's that, <laughs> what, what is this you speak of? Are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And how, she, how she informed today? me since I left Bozeman to go to the sheep show, the shot show, and then here, she has filled the gas tank on the snowblower three times. So part of the pleasure of coming here in <laughs> archery season is to escape. Well, I mean, I was here in December. True. I, I'm sure yeah. it's no garden spot it, it, in Bozeman no, in December. It's, it's certainly no <laughs> garden spot in December either. So, but well, I uh, I'm going to think about that. Because yeah, I mean, it's like uh, that's what I was saying. Like, if if I really hope somebody sticks one with a with a bow while I'm here, because I mean, that's yeah, I'm just a cook. That's yeah. super impressive as a hunter. Yeah. Well, and none of us are sitting water. It's all spot and stock, mm. which is. I mean, most of the guys I know who have taken a coos with a bow, the majority have done it sitting water. And I, I mean, I don't blame them, but I don't have the fortitude. I, I got some sort of like chronic disease of, I heard the a bird trooper and I got to get out of the blind and walk over and see what that bird is. Or I, I, I can't sit like that. So I'm, I, I got to just so, deal, deal with the hand I'm dealt. I've kind of always wanted to go to like Saskatchewan or Alberta to hunt those like crazy whitetails that are up there. They're like, you know, normal bucks, like 300 pounds. And it's yeah. got these weird tree trunk antlers and, and, uh, but they hunt them in these ground blinds and like ridiculously cold weather. And like, so yeah, we're going to drop you off at, uh, you know, six in the morning and we'll pick you up at six at night. Like, Oh, I don't want that deer that bad. <laughs> right. I, I don't, I, the, I, I admire people who can do it. Yeah. And they're going to have way more success than me. But they're not going to have as many days in the field as me mm. because they're going to be successful. I'm just going to fumble and stumble and, and, uh, there is make something to be said. I mean, I mean, just today, like, you know, we were chasing ducks all day and we failed all day long until the very last, yeah. you know, I mean, as the sun was going down, we made it with maybe 10 minutes to spare. Yeah. Well, it was close today. I, that, if that buck, if I would have known where he was sneaking through and I lost sight of him, he can, like always happens, right? They come where you least are prepared. The gray ghost. Yeah. And Marcus, the camera guy, is like, he's right over there, 40 yards. And I look, and the buck is walking right through this little opening. I'm like, oh. But we'd lost him. We, we we hadn't seen him for 150 yards, and it looked like he was following the other deer. No. Nope. Oh. So, all right, here's you have to promise me this, right? Yeah. So I did this to to my friend John when I, on my rifle hunt. Yeah. It's like when I saw the opportunity, I shot that deer. If you see the opportunity with your bow, you just shoot that deer. It doesn't matter if Marcus or somebody else has the camera on it. <laughs> I can't. You shoot that deer, I, I man. I can't because in our world, if it's not on video, it didn't happen. It actually does. It, it, it's it, still a dead deer that you get to eat. It, well, that's true. <laughs> and if the audio is b bad, audio means bad video also. So we, we, got, we got a lot of things going on out there. It's, yeah. I, I can assure you if I ever end up arrowing a coos deer on film, spot and stock, it's going to be my greatest hunting accomplishment. Uh, and I don't care if it looks like a little African dick dick or whatever. <laughs> whatever those, that, no, today the there was one bucks. in there yeah. and I asked Wade, I'm like, do you guys have a limit of how long the antlers have to be? He's like, no, if it's a protruded polished antler, I'm like, good. Cause there's one down here. He's like two inches. <laughs> And I'm making a stock on him, and Marcus says, we could call him a Sonoran Dick Dick. <laughs> like <laughs> those little... They're only slightly larger. I maybe. know. And this one just had like those little straight up spikes coming out. I'm like, that's right there. That'll do. But Man. I only got to 74 yards of him, and I'm not good enough. I didn't nah, even pull even an like arrow a Welsh longbowman for that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Some guys can do that. I'm, I don't have that talent. So. Well, speaking of antlers. Yeah. We haven't even begun to talk because Hank and I's adventure continues tomorrow. Oh, we yeah. We are going oh, to chase yeah. jackalopes. We're trying to get a buck jackalope. So the last one I shot scored 65, which uh -huh. is good for a jackalope. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm trying to get one over 100. Yeah. And, you know, a 100-inch jackalope typically is, it's usually five by four. 
at least, and and I'm I'm counting the eye guards, of course. Sure. Yeah. But um, <laughs> nine pointer. Yeah, nine, yeah, nine pointer. <laughs> <laughs> We're not lying. There is actually an animal called a jackalope that lives in Arizona. Called uh, called the antelope jackrabbit. Right? Which you know, it's a jackalope. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we saw one two nights ago, and I came back and. I, I don't know if you were here, Hank. I asked you, Jonathan. I said, are there rabbits here that are like three feet tall with white butts? <laughs> yes. And you're like, yeah, that's an antelope jackrabbit. That thing sat right out my truck window at like five yards. Which is amazing. Yeah, because you told me you got to shoot them with like a... 22s. Yeah. yeah. At 250 yards or No, something. but, you know, 80 or 90 or 100, you yeah. know. So we're going to spot and stock like you are, except uh-huh. we're going to have rifles. Huh. Because these rabbits, this, where you, where we're up here in the hills and all that stuff, this is actually pretty lush, you know, kind of environment. But it's not exactly right. We're gonna go drop down into, into the valley where, it's it's jackrabbit heaven. Really? And yeah, oh, there's a so lot. So are of we rabbits. having jackrabbit for dinner tomorrow night? Is that the plan? Well, I mean, I can't. I, I can neither confirm nor deny that, sir. <laughs> well, we already have a cottontail in the fridge. We do. We have ducks and we have a quail. What what did you say uh, the the one of everything stew or something? Uh, one of everything stew is, is is we're working on it. What we you got, got a quail, stew? we got a rabbit. <laughs> yeah, we could throw a duck in there. Yeah, we can throw a duck in there. We you could throw a jackrabbit. We need in a there. jackalope. And you know it might be nice to put some coos deer in there. Jeez, to be it for sure me. Would, yeah. But you're, <laughs> if you are counting on me, I think you should count on David or Brian or, or Sam, because if you're counting on me, it's gonna be a uh, it's gonna be a nothing stew, a one of nothing stew, a rock stew. Yeah, but no, this is such a cool place. People to ask me, you seem so excited about going back there. I'm like, if you go there and do it. You're going to want to come back every year. Right. It's it just well. This is just really so cool. Like to me, the coolest part of this is everyone we've had, you know, in the house of you know, gone or either you know still here, and we're all taking these fantastic adventures every day. And everyone's and doing something different. We're all heading day. off in different directions to go do something. Yeah. And so there, there's that opportunity for everything. Like I, I, I don't, I, you know, whatever your interest is, if it's slinging sticks and, and strings, if it's, you know, shotgun and 10 gauge yeah. monsters out on a lake, if it's, you know, spot and stock jack, I mean, there's just, there's, you know, running bird dogs and, and fancy over and unders. It's just, it's, it's all here. And it's a, as you said, you said, you said, John, I, you know, the, I don't know who ordered this weather, but man, he's getting an extra tip because it's just been beautiful. Yeah, um, yeah. for Jan- we're here in late January. I mean, it's you know warming up to to nearly seventy during the day. You know, so it's it's been it was a over nice seventy summer. today. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it was really warm today. Yeah, and but it's so, so it's you know it's chill in the morning. It's we, the temperature swing is in a, in full effect. So it's cold in the morning, oh, you're yeah. layering up, and then you're taking but it off as the day wears on. I, after you said how hard these uh, jackalope jackrabbits whatever they're called are to kill i'm on a mission now to get one with archery gear make it so number one <laughs> it, it, it would i i had no idea we saw two of them that night that i could have shot right yeah. from the road the the one just it was like he knew that i don't shoot things yeah. from the road they do they know this yeah so he's out there <laughs> yeah. but he he's in for trouble well, there's a, and but there's a reason why, Randy. So you actually got really close to see one, and and what's what's so impressive about these these antelope jackrabbits? There ain't squat that can catch them. Yeah, uh, bobcats, coyotes. I mean, uh, a hawk will randomly get one simply because they didn't see it coming. Because and th- so they'll just sit there like, huh? Wow, you're interesting. I can I can leave it at the the blaze of uh, you know. I can almost outrun a bullet pretty much, you know, and they just kind of stare and stare at me. But they have this really neat feature when you, when you get close to them, when they go to high alert, their whole like head structure changes and they look very prehistoric and angular. Their, their pupils dilate. They get this, like their nose flares up. It's like, I'm getting ready 
to just burst into action, the fight or flight real quick. Huh. And and so if you get a chance to see them, I mean, look at them. Their eyes go real big and the pupils dilate and their their head just kind of gets angular because they don't, when they're in that form, they just don't look like rabbits anymore. You're like, you're looking at some weird prehistoric beast. <laughs> and when they're calm and at rest, it, they, they, they soften, they go back to being a rabbit again. And, you know, the, the, that rounder face style and, and all that. But it's, they're, they're neat. Like I said, I mean, you know, these things average nine pounds. Nine on the pound phone. Jack mm-hmm. Graham. Yeah. And, I, and that one shot. I saw, I bet you he was every bit of that. I, oh, yeah. yeah. They're, the, they're the largest in terms of length lagomorph in North America, but white-tailed jacks and, um, and Arctic hares can approach nine pounds as well. Yeah. Well, and Arctic like hares can get that big? Arctic hares are bigger than, white, than uh, white-tailed jacks. You know white-tailed jacks because that's, that's yeah. what would have lived. Well, no, actually, they're not in Kuchiching, but they would be in snowshoes. Yeah. But white-tailed jacks are, uh, it's, it's a, a lot of people call them snowshoe hares, but if you live in like central North Dakota, then you said you saw a snowshoe hare, you didn't. You saw a white-tailed jackrabbit. Okay. Yeah. So these are the poor suckers that, do, do they live in eastern Montana? Yes, absolutely. So you'll see them in a year when we don't have a lot of snow yet. Oh, yeah. It's and, so sad. Yeah. And here's <laughs> this white blur going out across the yeah. brown prairie. It's like, that dude ain't going to make it very yeah. long. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's... <laughs> bummer. Bummer of a transition we, pattern. When I, when I get in that situation, I have sympathy on them. I, like, I might shoot a couple for the table, but I feel really sorry for them. I'm like... Uh. Sorry, dude. I mean, like, the weather just screwed you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, huh. So those are that big also. This thing looks they're, bigger than any yeah. of those. Uh, it's, or is it just because they're it's bulkier? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Like I was telling you earlier, so, um, you know, they average nine. Um, one of the, the uh, scientists down here, the, the biologist who was, he did a study on, on black-tailed jacks and antelope jacks down here in, in uh, southern Arizona, and and his biggest, according to his, his research, was a 13.3 pounder. That's a big 13. one. 13.3 pounds. Um, wow. We hold a, a, a youth, a junior's jackrabbit camp every year, probably our most successful event. We take all these new hunter ed graduates who've barely pulled triggers, you know, yeah. on, and they haven't shot any big game or anything yet. They just got out of hunter ed. They probably had a little bit of work with their 22. And we take them on this jackrabbit hunt as, as kind of their first hunt instead of pushing them into deer or something else. Right. It's like everything you do with a deer, you do with this this jackrabbit. Yeah. And um, it's been a hugely successful event. And kids, you know, the, the, the kids love it. We, we get a lot of data, but out of that camp. So right now, I think, um, and Jim Heffelfinger might have to back me up on that. I believe our heaviest from the camp so far has been like 12 pounds. Um, eight ounces or something like that. I mean, we're, we're approaching 13. We just haven't had the, like, the one that Voorhees had seen. Uh-huh. So uh, <laughs> really, really, have, I've got one mounted. It's, it's my favorite taxidermied mount of all the things that I have. It's this big animal because I know the taxidermist was cussing me out when he was doing the ears because the ears are so big <laughs> on this thing. Um, but, Do you have uh, a smoking a cigarette? No, no. This is, this is a, a nice traditional. I, 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 I love getting the jackrabbits mounted, but I, I had to get this one done. Cause, and actually, there was no forms. The taxidermist was like, there's no forms for this rabbit. Like, they don't even make them. He, and so he does uh, death casting. And he said, you know, usually I charge a lot extra for this. He said, but because there's absolutely no molds for this, he's like, I'm going to death cast your rabbit for free if you allow me to use it as a form so he can sell his own forms yeah. because no one else has them. And uh, so we did that and it's, it's just one of my favorite mounts. And I think that one was, um, I think it was 10 pounds, eight ounces. It was, it was a really big rabbit. She was oh. beautiful. So I'm like, all right, I got to get this one mounted. So. so in your book, Hank, you treat jackrabbits and hares differently than cottontail rabbits. I do. Because and of because they're different. It's from a cook's perspective, they're radically different. Yeah. So the the oh, like a jack of any kind, except for snowshoe. So a jackrabbit of any kind is closer in the kitchen to venison than it is to a cottontail. Okay. Uh, it's a very mild red meat, uh, very lean, very mild red meat, and um, you know the jackrabbit is much maligned for a lot of reasons, but none of them are valid. <laughs> really? So yeah. you, you can make high quality table fare from oh, a jackrabbit. Oh, absolutely. Rabbit. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a small deer effectively. And I, and if you've ever mule deer hunted in the great plains, yeah. who among us has not pulled up on 
a set of ears and like uh, uh, it's a jackrabbit. Yeah. You know, it's so many times like some a mule deer doe will be sitting in the grass and I'll see the ears. I'm like, all right, it's a mule deer right there. And it's a jackrabbit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it happens all the time. I, mean, I if laugh you, if, because, yeah, it, yeah, it's no. happened. <laughs> huh. Well, I'm uh, I, I'm interested to see what what kind of fruit you bring back. Oh, I hope tomorrow. we get some. I you get some or catch some. Get some. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If we catch them, we have to be fast. Yeah. <laughs> Super fast. And I was a good runner, but I'm always not uh, that good a runner. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't a good runner, so I, I I have a hard time catching a spruce hen, let alone a jackrabbit. So I like sprucies. They're cute I do too, and they're delicious. They are. Everybody seems to hate on spruce grouse, and I think it's because a lot of times people are eating them in like the middle of winter or something crazy mm -hmm. like that, right. when they only have the, the, the pine needles. Yeah. But I, you know, I had a bunch of spruce grouse when they still had fruit around, so yeah. September, October. They were amazing. Yeah. We uh, did a moose hunt in Alaska up on the Katil River. Mm -hmm. And I, all I can figure is that that's where the best gravel was for them to come and pick gravel. And we'd be floating down, and I'd beach the boat, and I'd run over there. Kaboom, kaboom. <laughs> <laughs> the camera guys are like, what'd you see? I <laughs> saw a grouse. <laughs> they thought I saw a moose or something. I never did shoot a moose. I never even shot at a moose on that trip. I bet you but, gained weight from eating so many grouse. <laughs> oh, we, we were cooking grouse every night. And they were spruce grouse, and they were excellent. Oh, yeah. That was in mid-September. That's another you know unloved animal is a sprucey. Yeah. Yeah, I there, there's tons of those in northern Minnesota. Or used to be, I don't mm -hmm. know if there still are, but people just drive past them. And they're like, yeah, I don't need any of those. Yeah. But if the, I mean, if your limit is five grouse, or spruce or rough combined, mm. I mean, I will take rough over spruce. I would, but like, I think I, I think a nice a nice bag would be three roughed and two sprucies. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Because the spruce is kind of a single-serving animal, yeah. so like everybody gets a spruce grouse. Yeah. So you know you've got a couple because they're, they're they're more interesting mm -hmm. than rough grouse. Rough yeah. grouse are until you age them. Um, rough grouse are uh, a more interesting chicken, but a spruce grouse in this in, in again like you were talking about in September October is a more interesting rough grouse. Now they they change, you know, once you get to November December January, right. and they. They, they get darker, they get more sort of turpentine -y. Yeah. Um, But, and a roughie's, you'll never go wrong with a roughie. Yeah. Then you can shoot a roughie at the end of the season, and then they're still delicious, so. So I've got friends who, when they hunt pheasants, grouse, ducks, whatever, they gut them and hang them for three yep. days or however. I don't know. I don't. Am I a fool for instantly... Sort of, down and sort of. Um, so a pheasant, especially, um, yeah. a fresh pheasant is a boring chicken. <laughs> okay. An aged pheasant is a, an amazing thing to eat, and and so I I, I only age. I, all of this is in, is in the new book, uh, in, in in heavy detail because there's right. a lot of science it, behind. I know. I saw that, and yeah. I'm like, this is great stuff. People yeah. like me need to know that. Because I mean, people like it seems super unhygienic to like hang a game bird in fifty-five degree weather yeah. for days, even you know, more than a week. Sometimes um, it seems counterintuitive because if you age venison or elk or whatever, you got to be just above freezing. Yeah. So clearly, this is this is. And I mean, and if you age a goose or or a duck at fifty-five degrees for an extended period of time, it's going to go off too. Well, the biggest difference between you know waterfowl hanging a waterfowl and hanging a, a, a pheasant or a grouse is there's no down. So a pheasant or a grouse can lose heat much faster than a comparable size waterfowl because of the down. So that makes you sense. want the animal to, to drop heat to that 55 degree point as fast as possible. It can't be gut shot, so you feel around the tail. You feel around the vent in the tail. Yeah. If your hands come away bloody, yeah, you should deal with it. That day or the day after doesn't yeah. matter, but you don't want to age a gut shot bird. Um, and but all of the science points to for if you if you're listening to this and you can hunt real deal wild roosters seven days between fifty and fifty five degrees, and then dry pick them because it'll be super easy to dry pluck at that point, uh, and and you will 
you're welcome. I mean, I'll just put it that way. I mean, <laughs> huh. it's it's one of those things where like, oh my God, that's why the pheasant is the king of game birds. So in that instance, you shoot one, you break a wing is all, and the dog goes and tackles it. Mm-hmm. There's no pellets, no puncture oh, into the gut yeah, cavity. Yeah, especially if it's that's the case. So you... The, I call that well shot. The, call it what? I call well, that well shot. Okay. So <laughs> in that instance, you'd pull the guts out and no, hang I leave it, them, I leave leave them, them in hole. Really? Yeah. Except, you know, the difference is once you get bigger than a pheasant, you can't do it because thermal inertia, inertia kicks in. So the mass of, yes. of is too large. So like for, a turkey, you have to gut. Right. A uh, goose, you have to gut. I huh. can tell you, Randy. So Hank turned me on to this. And he's like, he's like, come on. He's like, look, you know, the, the, the Europeans do that. I mean, it's all kinds of stuff right. they're doing over there. And I was like, okay, well, you know, and it, it, it scared the daylights out of me the first time I tried. I'm like going, man, I don't know. Cause it's just, you're just, you're, I think you're just taught these, these food practices that have, you know, caused humans to For exist sure. as long as we have, because we've learned, oh, well, you know, Bob let that can of tuna sit out all day and ate it and yeah, now he's dead. Um, so, <laughs> so you kind of, you, you know, you, you, I think you transpose those, those philosophies on other things and, um, oh my Lord, it changed my life. I was just like, this is the greatest thing I think I, you know, that, that culinarily could have happened to me. I'm like going, it, the, the tastes are phenomenal. It's a whole different, really? it's a whole different animal, um, now when you're you know because i would yeah it's it's fresh or whatever and i was i was pretty good about plucking most birds right away and just you know i'd, I'd work through it because i i learned pretty early on that that skin is awesome mm-hmm. um you know i i learned that from days with my mom when i was a kid and everything but um yeah i was like ah this aging thing i don't know it scared me to death first time i did it and then i ate it and went wow this mm. is the difference so general rule like even if you're don't want to get do this whole hog yeah. If you want to pick your birds, which I highly recommend with upland birds, yeah. Just well, first of all, if when you shoot them, keep them cool as best you can. Like if it's a hot day, um, just don't just just don't pack them all in your in your uh, game vest. Yeah. So that they all get hot together. Try and keep them separated and get some air on them. And then if and then cool them down as fast as you can. And then just throw them in the refrigerator for three days. Okay. In a plastic bag. Hopefully that nobody squeamish will see. So, because you have like you know ten dead quail in a fr- in a fridge, right. but but those that three days. So what that does is it's not like super well aged, but it's it's aged enough where picking that bird is a million times easier. The worst time to pick a bird, an upland bird, is when it's cool or a day old. Huh. If you pick it right when you you know when it's still warm. Then the feathers come off really easy. But as soon as it gets into rigor mortis, and until it's out of rigor mortis, it's a bear. And like everybody listening here is like, oh, I tried to pick a pheasant once and I ripped it to shreds. Well, that's probably why. Because huh. once you let it get out of rigor and wait a couple, two, three days, um, it, it's still, it's not as easy as plucking a dove, but it's way easier. Way easier. To the huh. point where you're like, oh, well, I think I'm going to do this more often. Yeah. And I'll give you a pro wow. tip from an Arizona bird hunter. All right. Because we have to worry about heat. Heat, yeah. Especially in the early season with our game vests on. And so I always carry around an extra couple a couple of the instant cold freeze packs out of first egg kits. When I start getting birds and I notice it's really getting warm, I'll crack one open so that way it's you know it's it starts running cold and I just throw it in with the birds. Oh, that's a good idea. Just to huh. keep it, you know, okay, here, you know, or something. We'll keep them cool. And it's nice because then it's cool on your back, too, because yeah. you're like, okay, I got a little, little An- bit of that myself. Another so. trick is to get one of the little game straps like you'd have for a duck, and they make little ones for yeah. upland birds. Um, so most game vests, no matter what company you buy, right. have a little loop right at the center of the top of the back. Yeah. You can hitch that game strap to the center of that uh-huh. and put your birds on that so they're swinging in the wind. Right. And they're that out of your way. Yeah. But they're in the wind and they cool out. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, if it's you know, damn hot like Arizona yeah. in October, um, that you need to be a little bit more, but like in a typical, like the rest of the country, that's a good, also a good opportunity. Huh. Well, I'm going to read that in more detail, Hank, because when I was thumbing through, I'm like, all right, I got some buddies who do this. And when they invite me over for something, I'm like, no, that guy leaves his birds hanging out there in the garage <laughs> with the guts in it. Well, you do realize week. he's not dead, right? 
<laughs> True. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, he's got to he's got to have some weird taste buds. I, 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 it's what you said, Jonathan. You kind of have these traditions of how mm-hmm. you handle meat, whether it's how you clean your fish or how you cut your game or whatever. A three to seven year, a three to seven day old roughy picked and mm-hmm. roasted is a deathbed meal. Really? Like, absolutely. Like, if I, it's if that's if I'm going, that's what I want. Huh. So you pick them after you cool them. Yep. Yep. And you leave the guts in. I do. You don't have to. Uh, it's just it's much easier to pluck a bird that's not been gutted. True. Because you have surface tension on the skin. Yeah. And just get used to your wife saying, "Honey, what are these things staring at me inside the fridge?" <laughs> I just put a plastic bag in there yeah. and like. Well, you know, Holly but, doesn't care. I, I already have that, Jonathan. So I yeah. have my own fridge for <laughs> for leeches for walleyes. When, when, oh. you, when you fish walleyes, you order leeches the by the pound. world's ickiest bait. And, yeah. and, and then uh, I trap a lot of muskrats. Yeah. And if you leave muskrats just laying there, the bacteria inside them, you'll get what's called green belly. Mm. So oh, you, yeah. and you never want to put a muskrat on a stretcher that's still wet because it'll mat the hair down. So I always put them in my fridge, my, my fridge, not my mm-hmm. wife's fridge, and lay them on some sort of newspapers or something. But you got to make sure you have them in a cool temperature on a cool surface. Well, then the fur will slip, belly. too, if, it's, uh, if it gets too warm, right? Yeah. What will? The, the fur, fur will slip, too. Yeah, yeah, it will if it gets too warm. Well, I, and that's I, how I earned my own freeze and, and refrigerator because of episodes like that with my wife going, John, why are there things staring at me when I open the refrigerator <laughs> door? She's like, yeah, you can I, get your own freezer and refrigerator if, now. If there so. are any uh, women listening to this podcast, it is completely appropriate to buy your husband a spare refrigerator for Father's Day. Because that's where their beer goes. There you go. I mean, I can't drink, but, <laughs> you know, I, I've I got... I use my beer fridge as, it's an alternately a beer fridge. It hangs birds. Sometimes it dry ages venison, and sometimes it hangs salami. Depending on the time of the year, uh, multi-purpose. Exactly. Yeah, that, that to me that is what's called a good investment. Right. right? <laughs> that 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 right there ranks high on the scale of good investments. But man, I feel like we're just getting started on the idea of small game and birds. We we'll just have to come back and do some more. Yeah, but I I almost wish we would have done this tomorrow night after you guys shoot a jackalope, uh, jack uh, animal. Jackalope, Antelope, jack it's a jackalope. <laughs> <laughs> All right, these guys are going with a nine-point jackalope, but uh, it's, it's hard to find the nine-pointers. I saw one. The one I saw must have been a doe. It was a doe because it, it just had a big white yeah, tail. We've had a all. real hard time finding the antlers this year. It's been they they shed yeah. they shed around December. And oh, it's just, there you go. So that, you, a lot of people think yeah. coosier antlers. You know the sheds that they pick up. They yeah. think those are from coosier. They're right. not. They're really not. They're yeah. from the jackalope. There we go. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be young, inexperienced people listening to this podcast and say, I heard Hank Sean, some biologist guy, say there really are jackalopes. <laughs> yeah. And they're going to get in an argument at work tomorrow. Well, so I get calls about jackalopes every year, and it's starting in August. Every year I start getting from really? people, yeah, and other states, Usually they from want to come drug. to Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they want, to, they want to shoot jackalopes. And um, so I have to explain to them the this, this story and history of jackalopes. Yeah. But then I finish the conversation by saying, there actually is a bird called a snipe, and you don't hunt them with a, a pillowcase and a flashlight. <laughs> exactly. And then they're like, oh, now you're pulling my leg. I'm like, no, legitimately, we shoot them with shotguns. They're like, yeah, now you're just, like, my buddies are screaming at me, telling me that there's jackalopes. And then <laughs> now you're telling me there's snipe. And I'm like, no, it's honest to goodness truth. So I'm like, I can't win for trying. But. Speaking of snipe, you hunt a lot of snipe? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Holly and I have had a really good season this year. Do you guys use decoys? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, no. I have a friend in Helena, Montana who makes snipe decoys. That's not how you hunt, hunt snipe. You walk them up. Not him. They don't fly into decoys. He says that when they get flushed, they will fly the the, the beach and they will land in his decoy. Oh, wow. That's the new one on me? That's yeah. interesting. I should send I bought a couple from him. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, yeah. No, we just walk them up. Uh, I, me too. Yeah. And how big of groups do you find them in? Uh, on a good on a good field, there can be 150 in a field. Yeah. On a bad field, there's two. Yeah. You know, and on a really bad field, there aren't any. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, and Ralph started making snipe decoys. Ralph. I thought it was a joke. Yeah. But that guy is a snipe fanatic, Ralph Yeager and Helena Montana. Oh, I need to meet him. You should. The, it's a very small, you know, confederacy of, of snipe yes. hunters. It, when you say confederacy, that is the appropriate term. He is like... Uh, He's not wired like the rest of the bird hunters I know. You know, bird hunters are kind of wired differently mm -hmm. anyhow. Ralph is wired even a little bit beyond that. You know the the epicenter of maniac snipe hunters are, to my, to my knowledge? Huh. Florida. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. So they have snipe all across the mm -hmm. North America? Oh, yeah. Okay. They're global, actually. Really? Uh, the the Irish and the French are very, very big snipe hunters. Hmm. No, I've uh, I've shot a couple only by accident. It wasn't. Yeah, we've limited a couple times this year. Huh? I, actually, I I ate it. Yeah, they're delicious. It's good. Yeah. There's a you know there's a whole chapter on snipe in the book. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> One this more book, book for the book on the way. Yeah. This, yeah. this book is going to require me to kind of spend more time out in the marsh and the well, woods. Well, I mean, your the... your bow hunting career is taking off so well that you know. Yeah, my <laughs> bow, my bow hunting career. <laughs> You know, I'm embarrassed to admit the last three arrows I've released have went right over the back of every oh, animal. That's uh, that's hard to hear. Yeah. It also but. actually, it's, it's good. It's, 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 in some ways, it's good for me to hear because yeah. people are like, yeah, you should get into bow hunting. I'm like, if Randy Newberg can't consistently stick animals, there's no, I have no hope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you probably don't get as excited as I do. <laughs> I, I feel terrible. Uh, I had this thing about archery mule deer. The first two archery mule deer tags I had, I filled. I'm like, nothing to this archery mule deer stuff. Any, anybody can kill an archery <laughs> mule deer. My last five archery mule deer tags? Wow, five. Zeros. Goose Yikes. eggs. But I have released two arrows. Over the back? Only to see the arrow clear the back, and the Ugh. deer looks as this arrow goes rattling through the rocks behind it see the problem with archery seasons is they tend to be separated from rifle seasons yeah what you need is to shoot that bow and like oh it's over the back whip out your shotgun yeah. and just hit him with buckshot there you go <laughs> I, I oh you could have you ever shot deer with buckshot uh, i have i i have yeah. in montana at uh there's an there's areas that are Shotgun, archery, or muzzleloader only. And mm -hmm. I'm not doing that slug stuff, man. I'm out there with Ooh. double up buck. So I don't, uh, I'm going to preface this, but I've not paid by anybody who's involved with this, but mm -hmm. uh, the, I've shot the Savage 20 gauge pump, uh, bolt action um, slug, slug gun. gun. Oh my God. It's like, it's a, if I lived in the East Coast, I would totally buy that gun because really? it's just like shooting a bolt action rifle. Huh. And it shoots these Sabit slugs at 20 yeah. gauge, so it doesn't kick you like a mule. Right. Yeah, 12 gauge, you don't want that. And uh, like, like, I don't need it. Like, I have no need for this gun, but it's a super cool gun to shoot. Huh. My wife shot a buck, a whitetail buck with a double lot buck. It was running down the trail right at her. And I made this drive and a, it's a, the, it's the place we do it was this uh, Canyon Ferry Wildlife Management Area. Now everyone's going to go hunt there this fall. <laughs> but uh, I sat around the trail. I said, mm, just sit here. I had no more than started, and I heard kaboom, boom, <laughs> Randy, I think he's dead. <laughs> I hope he's dead. And I walk up there, and buckshot is bad news. Oh, yeah. Broke both front legs, broke its neck. Wow. Oh, yeah. I don't know how many does. It's illegal I've, in a bunch of states. It is in yeah. some states. I've, I sh this was in, oh, this is quite a few years ago, but I shot a buck uh, with the lot buck at 55 yards and just folded him. I mm. mean, like he got hit by lightning. <laughs> and uh, we've shot many white-tailed does with the lot buck. It's so a I, big thing in New, like New York State. Is it? Yeah. Okay. And uh, no, Northeast. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to start going to state legislatures and Western Game Commissions and say, I think we need a buckshot season. <laughs> Hell with this uh, extended archery stuff. I would think it would be, an, uh, you just fold it into the muzzleloader season. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, they should let you shoot in muzzleloader seasons. Why don't they let you shoot? Uh, they should. It's a similar range. Yeah. Well, hell, you see of course some you of those get more new, shots. You see some of those new muzzle loaders are like three hundred yard operations. Three hundred? Wow, yeah. I've heard two, but wow. Yeah, but well, now I'm excited because Hank likes this bolt action twenty gauge so much. I think when I go visit Northern California to hunt 
ducks and geese with him, I'll bring the bolt action 10 gauge. Oh my so God. He can is, is your 10 gauge a bolt action? I, that's my very first gun. It sits in my safe. It's a Marlin model. 55 I was going to say, Super my dad Deuce. had one. It's 54 inches tall yeah. overall length. It's oh. a beast. Yeah. My dad had one. Does it have the drop in clip? It's got the magazine. The drop box yeah. magazine. Wow. And it's got a bolt, man. And I, mm -hmm. I, and I, just as fast as you're putting, you know, uh -huh. with, with your over and under, I can do it with that shotgun. Just cranging shells. Yeah. My we dad. need to go on a goose hunt with that. It's thing. so much fun. So, yeah. like, like it, well, if the geese aren't flying, like, all right, Jonathan can kill Hail them. Mary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why, you know, guys are like, you know, do you think that duck's too far out? I said, that's why I own a 10 gauge, so I never have to answer that question. <laughs> They're always in range. <laughs> wow. Oh, well, I'm usually a 20 gauge guy anymore. I'm getting Me too. soft I, Me for too. everything. I, I don't know. I mostly, it's kind of like this archery thing. I just don't like to hit things. You know? <laughs> I, I, just I don't know. I've like killed everything from a there. snipe to a New Zealand black swan with my 20 gauge over under. Really? It's the only shot kind of shoot. Huh. Yeah. Well, for me, it's, it's, it's nostalgia. Like I said, my, my very first gun my dad ever gave me was this bolt action 10 yeah. gauge. Um, and, you know, it's, it's carried me through a lot of seasons and, and uh, the primers are getting hard on, on shotguns and I bent the firing pin number of years ago and I got worried because I thought I'd broke it and it's mm -hmm. hard to find parts far. And, um, but, uh, so it's, yeah, it's a nostalgia thing. And it was like, well, I need a replacement. Oh, I'll get a semi-auto 10 and, and kind of run with it. But, uh, yeah, I, I just, my daughter's shotgun her youth shotgun, I got her as a 20 gauge and, and I got to, you know, play around with it a little bit, a little, little Remington 870. It's one of the greatest guns, it's got a little short stock. And yeah. I thought that was a lot of fun. So it's, I, you know, heck, if I, I, I don't think if any of us had guns and bows and arrow and everything to collect, I mean, what else is there, you know? True. I mean, we'd have to spend our money on foolish stuff. Sure. <laughs> like chicken or something. Yeah, something like <laughs> or that. Or taco yeah. seasoning. <laughs> well, guys, uh, you know, we got to get up early in the morning. So for the sake of the audience, who's probably now saying that Newberg is dumber than I thought he was after <laughs> Hank pointed out so many things I've done wrong and my career i think we're gonna let the let the crowd uh go their merry way with we've just ruined the sales volume for mccormick's mild <laughs> tacos so well, probably, i'd like to say that it's not uh, the mccormick is not the important thing here it's any mild taco seasoning in any packet by by any company all right. yeah. <laughs> So I'll have a lawsuit by two days from now. I'll get a certified letter from the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe <laughs> offering to... We'll, we'll settle out of court for the damages caused by your podcast. But uh, I really appreciate it, guys. Thanks yeah, for your time. I, I love these conversations. I just... Uh, I, I'm, I'm super excited to see... How many jackrabbits you guys get tomorrow? Oh yeah, and, you're putting the pressure on us. And what we're, what you're gonna do with them? Uh, that's so, easy. Oh, wait, when I ask <laughs> <laughs> Hank's in there cooking, I'm like, "How can I help?" He's like, "Well, you could clean up the dishes if you want." <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm good at that. That that's the response my wife would give. I mean, she's there's no hinting around. It's like. <laughs> Here you go. This is this is about all you're qualified for. So you're not gonna hurt my feelings, Hank. But well, thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Everyone, thanks for listening. And uh we'll give an update about how the jackrabbit hunting went. I'll I'll give a post mortem report here on on one of the future podcasts. But thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks a lot. Riley. Guys, 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 thanks, thanks a lot.